Welcome back to the 411 Podcasting Network. I am your host, Larry Zonka, and this is episode 77 of the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, the 411mania.com website, and any major podcasting platform. Please make sure to subscribe to our shows and take us to the pay window. Share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on the podcasting platform you are using. Joining me today in the first segment of the show is my normal co-host, Jeremy Lambert. Jeremy, how are you today, buddy? I'm watching the Panthers suck, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, fucking <laughs> football season this year, man, just... Yeah, not a good year. Are the Steelers going to make the playoffs? I truthfully uh, do not. There are is a chance, but like I think they have to win the last two games, and they're losing today, so it's unlikely. But they have a chance. Gotcha. So you're saying there's a chance? Yeah, and even if they make it, it's very unlikely that they move on. But oh well. All things yeah. considered, it could have been a much worse season. I mean they they got the the big fight against the Browns. That was cool, at least. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we lost starting quarterback, you know, Brown and uh, Le'Veon Bell left, and then we're like, played a bunch of backups and like a four-string quarterback named Duck all fucking year, so it's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I don't know what people were expecting, it could have been a lot worse. And all about injuries to the star quarterback, the Panthers dealt with that as well, so, yeah, once you lose your quarterback, season just kind of go, goes to hell. Uh, 99 times out of 100, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. <laughs> so... But uh, we got a we got a busy show today, Jeremy. You and I are going to be dishing out some 2019 wrestling awards. Uh, later on, I'm going to be joined by the Cubs fan to talk some lucha libre and some good stuff there. So that'll be fun. And then uh, in the closing segment, going to be talking with Steve Cook, and we're going to be talking a little bit of wrestling news. We're going to be looking at uh, the perceived uh, loyalty Vince McMahon has to Jerry Lawler, and then. An old throwback to our blog talk podcasting days, the airing of the grievances. So it shall be a fun time. Festivus. That's right, a festivus for the rest of us. Uh, and on that note, a, uh, a Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, or whatever you're celebrating to everybody out there. Have a good holiday season. Uh, and we're getting to show out early this week since we don't have to do the normal Wednesday night stuff, which is going to be fun, but is also going to feel weird because I feel like really locked into it after 12 weeks. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I mean, is anything airing on TNT, AEW related at that time? No, slot? I think it's just uh, TNT's airing a movie of the week type thing, and uh, NXT's airing tape special, so. Yeah, I know. I knew NXT was airing something. I didn't know if uh, TNT was going to air like a Best of Dynamite or anything like that. I don't but believe I so. Not. I think it's just a movie. Well... That sucks for AEW. Could have used that spot for, I don't know, best of special. Put that uh, Cody and Dustin match on TV. There you go. Yeah, do something. But, but anyway, Jeremy, we're gonna we're wrapping up 2019 here, and uh, it's uh, it's been a good year in a lot of ways. And starting Christmas Day, I'm gonna have a run of columns breaking down my matches of the year. But today is awards day, Jeremy. Are you excited? Always excited to hand out some slammies. That's right. We're going to start off, Jeremy, and I'll get to you first. And kind of what we're going to do is uh, each category is kind of going to have some honorable mentions, and then we'll discuss what our number one pick is. We're going to start off with the biggest disappointments of the year. Let's get the bad out of the way first, Jeremy. All right. My my first honorable mention is Kenny Omega in AEW. Fair. I just hasn't quite lived up to to what it could have been really on that one um i'm pretty much doing three i did i did a top three for everything okay. so um my my second one is becky lynch after wrestlemania because she was red hot and then it turned into she got stuck in a feud with lacey evans and then natalia it finally picked back up with the sasha Banks stuff but there was a good six months where she did nothing after the biggest win of her career all righty and my number one is the fucking fiend and what that has turned into late in the year because they had something with this larry i know people want to will want to call it hokey and say like uh, you know, it's it's some clown, it's some stupid clown that just it's dumb, it's it's corny. 
they had something with the split personality stuff, with the the whole character, the the, the vignettes that Bray Wyatt was doing, and in a month they ruined it with that Hell in a Cell match, and now it's it's nothing. Like no one cares about this dude, and he's the champion. I can, cannot disagree with anything you just said with any of your picks there. I think those are all good ones. Uh, I went different route with mine. I have I have more than three for some of these because I just uh, some sometimes when you start going through these, many things pop out, you know. So uh, my first uh, honorable mention: No Lucha Underground season five. I miss Lucha Underground. Fair, I do as well. It sucks what happened to those performers with uh, those contracts, but at least that's all got settled too. Yeah. Uh, next up, because I know this angered a lot of people that love this thing, WWE 2K20 is a complete piece of shit. Yeah, that was always going to be trash. It's been trash for years. Yeah, but it seems like it was even worse <laughs> this year. Uh, it was, but it's been a bad game for years. Yeah. Uh, getting into more of the wrestling-related stuff, uh, WWE's continued struggles in regards to actually making stars, and I think you kind of nailed it with uh, the Becky Lynch booking after WrestleMania and The Fiend. They, and I agree. I mean, we can shit on a lot of the Fiend stuff, but a lot of it's being done in an after-the-fact type thing because it felt like they did have something with him. The stuff was over, and then it just fell off a cliff. So, uh, the, the Dude, problem... Summer, like, SummerSlam? Remember after our SummerSlam review? Like, that show wasn't bad, from what I, from what I recall. And, like, we were just gushing over the Fiend. Uh, because it felt like they were on the right track, yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, a month later, they did the Hell in a Cell thing, and that sucked, and it killed everything. So, uh, but yeah, that is, uh, next up, uh, Roman Reigns beats Leukemia only to come back and be booked as just another fucking guy. That's very fair. I I I thought about that one. I I like Roman, man. I think you could do... I think they missed the boat on changing him up a little bit after he came back. And I, I, I love the fact that, on one hand, that they didn't just rush him back into the world title scene. But they've also just made him another guy on the show at the same time, which is... It's one thing to have restraint in pushing him right back to the top. It's another thing to make him a guy. When he's supposed to be more just doesn't yeah. feel important yeah it's whatever they've done with him hasn't been good since returning and uh stuck in bad feuds and just Became unfortunately feud jesus and yeah. the the not the worst but you know at tlc he does the big spear spot to close the show because they had to take away the moment from uh kabuki warriors and then there was no follow up to that on SmackDown. Like, what? What are y'all doing? Yeah, it's uh, sad. My last honorable mention is uh, the, the Saudi mania continuing to run wild. These fucking million dollar propaganda shows, and everybody wants to talk about how it's such a nice feel good thing. And just, I have no time for it. Worst part of my job. My number one is something we've talked about several times, Jeremy. Just the the complete breakdown and fall of ROH in 2019. Just a completely sad story. And again, you go back to G1 Supercard. It looked like they were weathering the storm early in the year after losing SCU and the Elite and Cody and everybody. And it looked like they were going to kind of be okay. And then the Matt Taven title win happened. And a lot of interest and fans went along with it. Yeah, the... I can't argue with ROH, the fall of ROH being up there. And I figured you would have it on your list. And so I left it off of mine to try to be different. Um, and it's it's a huge disappointment, especially where they were to start the year. But I think even once AEW was announced, people expected ROH to kind of fall off because they were losing uh, three of their their big stars and then another guy they could bring in every now and again to to get over with angles so and then hangman as well so really four or five of their top guys but i don't think anybody could have predicted it was going to be a disaster like it ended up being this year yeah that's the thing nobody i mean i think we could have, yeah we could have expected a downturn but nothing like we got so 
Uh, next up, Jeremy, we're going to go to best non-wrestler of the year. And this could be uh, construed as many things. This could be announcers, managers, bookers, however you want to take it. Uh, what do you got? Bookers? I didn't realize we could do bookers. I added Gato to my list. Well, you can throw in Gato if you want. <laughs> um, sure. Gato's on there. He's been he's been good <laughs> as a manager and uh, as a heater and as a booker on New Japan as well. Um, I have Excalibur because thank God for him holding that entire crew together. He has to deal with Jim Ross every single week. And that can't be easy because have you heard Jim Ross, Larry? Yes, I have. It's not good. No, Larry. it's not. It's not good at all. Uh, second on the my honorable mention, and I, I feel bad for this guy because he unfortunately has not been around much this year, but I don't care. We need to remember that this man still exists. Taka. I miss Taka. I miss Zack Sabre time. I, I miss all of it. I hope he is back for Wrestle Kingdom because they, that that's that's the biggest story of 2020. If Taka returns at Wrestle Kingdom, I miss Taka as well, dude. I, I did. I always marked out for the Zack Sabre time. The funny thing about that is, you know, it's like they started that with the whole build up to Zack versus Okada, and like at the beginning, it was supposed to be a tongue in cheek mocking of the Gato Okada thing. And then it like got over and became really good. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I miss Taka as well, though. I hope he comes back on January 5th. And my my number one best non-wrestler, the big stoke, Malcolm Bivens. He, I, I don't know if he's wrestled a single match this year. He's not even like on NXT at this point. The content he provides on social media is, is some of the absolute best content I- anywhere else. The the CD player storyline that went through this whole year, like Might that started have been one in of April. the best angles all year. Yes, yeah, it was amazing. So, uh, yeah, big shout out to uh, Malcolm Bivens, Stokely Hathaway for for keeping it keeping it fun on on social media because he's not wrestling, unfortunately, he's not on TV, unfortunately. What do we have to do? To, we're gonna have to like start bribing Triple H to get Big Stoke on TV managing a stable man wait we've got to do something like what you you don't have a use for this guy like at at all you can't get him on tv as a talker like somehow i i don't get it yeah all right uh, i got four honorable mentions for mine uh number one going with a good standard lenny leonard uh love him uh he is a dude that does solo commentary almost all the time one of the few guys that can actually pull it off one of the better announcers overall in the business. So uh, I always love giving Lenny a shout out. And if you guys have watched Evolve, you know how good Lenny is. Uh, next up, uh, go to MLW for this one. Joseph Samael. Uh, I have no time for Joseph Samael as a wrestler. But as the mouthpiece heater manager for Contra, he's actually been great this year. And I'm also a mark for dudes fucking throwing fireballs at people. Yeah, I've liked him uh, with with Fatu. So um, I'm all with that. Uh, number three, Nigel McGinnis. I think Nigel is a really good announcer. I enjoy a lot, a lot of what he brings to the table. He's different. He's a great announcer in that regard that he's a former wrestler and can always wrap things around into how it makes sense into a match. I always feel he adds a lot. Uh, he did a lot of great stuff this year between NXT UK and 205 Live and NXT so, uh, yeah, really happy for Nigel. And I, I had posted the other night, I watched that uh, Nigel Beginner story on the network. Made me very sad again, just for the fact of how his uh, in-ring career ended. But uh, I do love that he's found something he seems to really enjoy, though, in commentary. So, love Nigel. Uh, number two, going back to MOW, Selena De La Renta. Love her. She's arguably the biggest star in MOW. She has been great all year long. Uh, love the impresario. I think she does a lot of great stuff for MLW. And number one, going back to the commentary table, Kevin Kelly. Best announcer in the business for my money, bar none. I can agree with that. Um, big fan of Kevin Kelly and what he does and what he brings to the table. The, the, my issue with Kevin Kelly is he's got to stop calling the Destino. <laughs> No, I, I like Kevin Kelly as well. Kevin Kelly is just so like 
it's almost a, a LeBron James MVP type thing with me where he's done it so often that it doesn't seem impressive anymore. Like I feel like Kevin Kelly has been the best announcer for the last two, three years now. And you know, LeBron and Michael Jordan both have this issue where like, okay, we know they're great. We just want something like we want to give this award to somebody fresh. Yeah. Yeah. I really like a lot of what Kevin does. I think he does a great job. So he does. Uh, Next up are the best tag teams of 2019. Jeremy. You go first. All right. Uh, before I get into the honorable mentions, I would say that if the Birds of Prey and Young Bucks would have had um, more matches in 2019, I would have really considered them in the list. They did really great stuff for the matches they worked, but they didn't have the volume of the other teams I'm going to list. Uh, first honorable mention is Taiji Ishimori and El Fantasmo. I think they've worked as a great heel tag team all year. Uh, lo- love what they've done, and I think they're really great. Uh, number three, uh, Santana and Ortiz had a really, really great year. Uh, all the stuff they did in Impact, on the way out of Impact, and into AEW. So, uh, continued success for those guys. Number three, um, the Briscoes. They get lost a lot because they're still in ROH, and there's a lot of people not watching ROH, but uh, still pretty much, they're, they're obviously the best tag team in ROH history. They have been one of the most and best consistent acts for ROH throughout 2019. And just unfortunately, they're not getting watched by a lot of people like they should. And uh, the runner-up to our winner, are I'm going Lucha Bros for tag team. Uh, they did a lot of great stuff all throughout the year as well. Love those guys. They're always uh, good for a great match. And um, no complaints. Number one is uh, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, the Undisputed Era, man. Um, Top-tier tag matches all year. They always deliver in takeovers, always deliver on TV. You can't discount how good those guys are and how great they've been for NXT all year long. All right. We had the same number one, but that's okay. My honorable mentions, I'm going to try to be different here. And I can't off the gate because I agree with Santana and Ortiz. I really like their... Uh, Impact stuff, the AEW stuff has been good for the most part, at least in ring wise. It's been it's been really good. Uh, the booking I've had questions about, but that's for another time or another podcast. Uh, but their their Impact stuff was excellent this year, and they got the headline uh, pay per view and the the whole feud with um, Lucha Bros, the whole feud with the the former LAX. Um, uh, like all of that was was really good stuff. So big fan of what Santana and Ortiz did, and they got themselves paid off of what they did in Impact as well. So good on them. I'll be different on this one. The Iconics didn't see that coming, did you, Larry? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> the wrestling not good. Their backstage vignettes and promo work and YouTube stuff amazing absolutely amazing um look it's a it's a partial joke honorable mention but they were the women's tag team champions i don't think they ended up being longest reigning i think they got surpassed by by bliss and cross but maybe not um but yeah their their backstage work and their promo work was absolutely uh outstanding i thought this year so in an effort to be different i will throw them on the list uh, i'm with you on the briscoes as an honorable mention because their roh work has been outstanding this year and then number one same as you undisputed era look they're they're the best tag team in wrestling right now for my money um and you could go fish in strong you can go fish and o'reilly you can go o'reilly and strong it really does not matter i know the, the consensus at least for this year is o'reilly and fish but I mean, the match where Roderick Strong had to fill in because Bobby Fish got hurt, like that still turned out to be a great match. Like all three of these guys are are excellent, and not only are they they having great matches, like the, even their storylines, their promo work, like that's good stuff too. So, Undisputed Era, to me, stands out over everyone else. Yeah, I agree. They're they're great, and again, they're they're just the biggest thing for them is they are so fucking reliable too. It's, I yeah, mean, like, you know, how, I mean, how many times do you open a, a takeover with those guys and you're like, you see him come on, and you're like, well, this is going to be great. 
You know, and it's like, and it yeah. always is. So, yeah, love those guys. A lot of good tag teams, you know. It's a, it's not a priority in quote unquote main WWE on Raw and SmackDown as it, as it, you know very much could be better. But uh, still, if you look around, there is a lot. And obviously, I mean, you know, Jeremy and I don't get a lot get to watch a lot of Lucha or like All Japan or Noah. And I know there have been I keep hearing about really great tag team stuff going on there too. So it's like. You know, if you're a main WWE fan of Raw and SmackDown and you're upset that you don't get to see enough tag team wrestling, you can still stay in the company. Just go to NXT and NXT UK. You'll find some really good tag stuff there. And it's all over the world, though. There is still great tag team wrestling out there for you to find. So I didn't even mention teams like, I mean, main roster teams like the Revival, the New Day, the Uso. Usos were gone for half of the year, but I mean, they're they're still up there as a top team. But like New Day, New Day had another great year this year um, in terms of just storylines and I mean, what they did off of camera as well, because I, I did mention the Iconics for that. So got to shout out New Day for that as well. Um, like they, they had an excellent year. I'm throwing them in my honorable mentions as well. Sure. Why not? All right. Best female wrestler of the year, Jeremy. All right. This was a tough one. This was a, a very, very tough one because it came down to to two people. Um, and it'll probably be no shock which two people are, are going to be. But quickly, honorable mentions. Charlotte Flair, um, she had a, a strong year. I think she's excellent i think she might be the best wrestler female wrestler in wwe honestly and, and i like sasha banks i like bailey i like becky lynch they have a lot of talented uh female performers but bell to bell charlotte is outstanding her moonsault needs some work i don't care what anybody says that moonsault to the outside doesn't always look great moonsault uh, on but the inside some... doesn't always look great either yeah <laughs> uh yeah that's very true um it's weird that it's just going to be like all horse women, but I mean, they, they dominate the year almost for the most part. Um, second will be Bailey because she had a solid year. Let's be honest. You know, she won the, the women's tag team titles. That run was cut short, but it was still an accomplishment. Um, then the, the heel turn to, to end the year was, was strong. I think character wise, she had a strong year wrestling wise. I, I truthfully can't tell you a Bailey match that I'm like, yeah, go out of your way to, to see that match. But character wise, Bailey had a very good year. Um, kind of tied Shayna Baszler, Rhea Ripley. Ripley came on strong at the end of the year. Uh, the, the beginning of the year, she was mainly like NXT UK and like she did fine in NXT UK. No one watches that show. Even when Ripley was there, like no one really watched that show. They don't watch it now. Uh, but the end of the year, starting with obviously the, the big survivor, really once she showed up on NXT television and stepped to Shayna Baszler, like it kicked off this outstanding run that culminated um, this past Wednesday when she won the title. And Baszler had a great year as well, defending the title, having some good matches against Candice, against Bianca. Uh, the Mia Yim match wasn't all that hot, but the the Rhea Ripley match was very good as well. And again, character work, like I think Shayna Baszler was the most legit woman of the entire year, honestly, because I don't think there was anybody who who played their character better than Baszler. First runner-up honorable mention, Becky Lynch, Kind of hate to do it to her because she main evented WrestleMania and did have a good year, especially just in terms of accomplishments. Problem was that dead summer for her just killed a lot of that momentum. And, you know, that was half the year right there. So it's tough to if, if half a year year is lost because of bad booking. That's it sucks for you. But, you know, it, it's it's still held against you. Uh, and so my my top female wrestler of the year is Tessa Blanchard. Uh, I think from start of the year to end of the year, she's been outstanding in every aspect with the 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 Tay of Valkyrie feuds, the, the Gail Kim, uh, moving on to wrestling the the men, like everything she's done ha- has been fantastic. So I'm going with Tessa Blanchard for best female. All right, very good. Yeah, and I'm I try to take into account not. You know, I mean, I think Jeremy kind of you got to the point of it too. Is it's it's about matches, moments, and overall influence, and how strongly they were booked all throughout the years. A lot of what I'm looking at. 
Uh, I'm going to start with Hannah Kimura from Stardom, who really had a breakout year this year. Really grew, got a lot better, was being pushed a lot. Uh, Mayu Iwatani from Stardom, just always excellent, really good stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next up, Miko Sadamura, just a, a fucking legit legend who is still killing it and putting on top tier stuff all the time. And it's just really great to see. And she's working with so many other people to help them come up and try to improve them. So love that. She also did a stint at the Performance Center this year, too, to help out. So it's always good to see. Um, number two, I'm going to go Becky Lynch as well. She had Becky had big moments. She had the WrestleMania thing. Um, a lot of a lot of t- um, a lot of highs in that regard, but yeah, that summer just that post WrestleMania booking and all the Lacey Evans stuff was just, oof. yeah, a lot of shine not came good. came off of Becky Lynch because of that, and it's not her fault. It's just the lackluster booking, which is problematic. But I mean, you, you can't discount what she did <laughs> did this year. She she's moved a lot of merch. She's been pushed heavily. She's worked really hard and largely delivered in her role. Um, the booking hasn't been sound around it. And I'm actually also going Tessa for number one because um, Tessa is the most over talent in Impact. She's, I think, the best talent in Impact right now. She's the most over talent in Impact. She's the one who had the biggest year in terms of growing from one level of performer to another. She's being pushed here in 2020 into a world title shot. And uh, given how over she is and how she's grown and everything, wouldn't absolutely be shocked at all if she won it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure some people will make arguments that there were other, like, you know, I'll even argue Mika Sodom War is a better wrestler than Tessa Blanchard had better high tier matches than she did this year. But in terms of overall growth and how importantly she was pushed for the promotion, uh, Tessa was the most important this year and she's being pushed into that world title picture. So, I mean, you can flip a lot of coins and change it around. I'm not going to argue if you want to put someone else at first, but that's why I'm going to. So I think you can, I think you can defend it rather easily. Yeah. I mean, I had Tessa as the top as well. And I guess to clarify on my decision-making, it really is a, a mix of everything and just who entertained me the most. That's why I had the Iconics up there, even though their matches sucked because they were entertaining to me. It's my opinion. If you don't like it, you can tweet me, and then I'll ignore you. Yeah, at me. Yeah, be a Twitter <laughs> tough guy, Jeremy. Someone tried to someone tried to get me beat up by Bully Ray on Twitter. They snitch tagged Bully Ray on me. What did you say? That that they got them to snitch tag. You. I was. I was listening to Bully Ray interview PCO on, you know, the Busted Open show. And Bully Ray is like, you know, you won the title this past Monday. And it was just like, all right. I mean, maybe it was a mistake. But he was, you know, he didn't even correct the mistake. He's like, you won on Monday. You won on Monday. He's like, you realize the show took place on Friday, right? Like, you were on it. And so my tweet was just like, Bully Ray not knowing when PCO won the title says something. I don't know what it says, but it's something. And someone tagged Bully Ray. It's like, you won't tag him. Like, you're not a man enough to to tag him. You're like, you're a coward. Uh, he's made a mistake, which I'm sure you've never done. Grow some balls. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I didn't reply to it. It was like, yeah, whatever. Like, no, I'm not going to tag the dude. Do you think I'm going to tag every single wrestler that I tweet about? Like, no one will fucking talk to me after that. Well, I I'll don't tell you what. Like what, everything. I'll tell you what, then. If, if people want to be fucking snitches, when this show gets posted, go ahead and tag Bully Ray and tell him to uh, listen to the airing of the grievances part. And he can sit there and bitch and ask if I know who he is all fucking day long because I have a lot to say about him <laughs> later in this but, motherfucker. So enjoy. I don't get People who tag people, like the wrestlers that you talk about are just, I don't get those people. What are they hoping to accomplish? I don't know. Like, honest question. If you snitch tag on on somebody, like, what is your ultimate goal? To get that wrestler to, like, go on some tirade on somebody tweeting? Like, enough of these wrestlers vanity search themselves anyway and well, dude, try I got, to reply. I got caught up in something because Austin Aries was vanity searching. Um, Jake Ziegler, who used to write for 411, um, retweeted the story about Aries talking about the Christy Hemi thing on the Chris Van Lee thing. 
And um, yeah, and he 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 retweeted. He goes, wherein Austin Aries clearly states that he doesn't understand what sexual harassment is. Yeah, and I laughed, so I favorited it, right? And all of a sudden, <laughs> fucking Aries is responding to this. He's like, motherfuckers don't know what I'm saying. Blah blah blah. And he's like in parentheses, like at Larry Zonka. Blah blah blah. And like I didn't even say anything. But because I favored what? it, Narius was out there vanity tweeting. I got it, and then people were retweeting it and bitching about me. And so I'm like, I didn't even say anything. What the fuck, man? But yeah, it's uh oh, the vanity searching is off the chain. What's funny is like Aries was clearly vanity searching after that interview dropped because yeah. you know pl- plenty of, of websites ran it and and like I, I I listened to it and when I listened to it I legitimately said like there's no difference between what Austin Aries apologized for and, and what Jim Cornette in the whole India <laughs> NWA fiasco what he was apologizing for like if you listen to both of those apologies or explanations. It's the same thing. It's obviously different situations. It's the same thing. And like I tweeted that. I was like, I don't think like it, it's funny. I think it was just like it's funny that they dislike each other so much because they had the same like apology or, or explanation for their, their uh, for their different situations. And Aries actually like tweeted at me because I, I wrote the I wrote the article about him explaining the the Bound for Glory uh, situation and. People were like, oh, this is such a great interview, blah, 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 blah. And Aries, like, he he saw that and he tweets at me because I was tagged in it. And he's like, oh, thank you. You know, thanks to Chris Van Vliet for uh, um, doing this interview. Thanks for all the publicity and writing it up and stuff. And I guess he didn't see the part where I compared him to Jim Cornette because I don't think he would have been so kind to me on those tweets. But yeah, the the vanity searching. Ryback actually unblocked me over the Chris Van Vliet interview. So me me and the Ryback are friends now after he vanity searched a little bit. Well, there you go. (laughs) I don't get wrestlers are weird with that stuff, man. Like, I don't get it. Yeah, I, I laugh at the people that have blocked me. Like, Velvet Sky blocked me years ago. Uh, Mike Kanellis blocked me this year. I guess he read my 205 Live reviews. So, what did you do to piss off Mike Kanellis? <laughs> I probably called him a bad wrestler at some point. Um, oh, the best oh, one is... Scary. Apparently, I made Gerald Briscoe mad because he blocked me, and I can only assume it's because I shit on Wes Briscoe so many times. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I kind of laugh, so. Anyway. All right, back to the awards, Jeremy. The best promotions of 2019. Um, Honorable mention. See, I don't watch, like, a ton of, I do watch a, a ton of stuff, but I mainly stick to your your kind of top indie stuff. I'm going to give an honorable mention to GCW. They don't like run storylines as far as I can tell, but all their shows have a little bit something for everybody. Joey Janela is a complete visionary where with how he took this company uh, years ago with Joey Janela's spring break. And now like they have their, it's WrestleMania weekend, but they have shit going on like, all weekend if you're a gcw fan and it's gonna have just you know they got like effie's big gay brunch joey ryan's i don't know if joey ryan's thing is part of gcw um but but uh for the culture obviously janella's thing a lot of their stuff isn't completely my style with the hardcore wrestling but they do shows where it's a little bit of, of everything and like they draw well and the crowds are always hot like you watch an ROH show and a GCW show, you would 100% think GCW is like the bigger and more popular and more well-recognized promotion. And it's, it's typically not. So, um, shout out to GCW. They've had a good year. Uh, honorable mention number two, I guess is AEW because the, it, I mean, they were nothing. They didn't exist at this time last year. And in 365 days, they they're on national television. They're running pay per views. They're they're selling out. They're putting on good shows. Um, they've revitalized the business to a point. Uh, let's be honest. The the viewership and stuff for Wednesday Night Wars have not been what we kind of were hoping it would be. They're just it, it's not really 
it did it didn't kick off the hot period that many thought it was going to um but still aew has had a great first year in terms of just everything they were able to accomplish in one year um i mean wwe has to be up there look say what you will about main roster and everything but the nxt is great people enjoy the main roster. Yeah, they're losing viewers every single week. They're still making billions. So WWE is there. Even if creatively you're not happy with something on Raw or SmackDown, look, watch NXT. You'll probably find something you like in that. And yes, NXT is part of WWE, whether people want to try to uh, say they're different or not. All that money is going to Vince's pockets. Don't kid yourself. Um, And my top promotion is New Japan because New Japan had a great year. Even though they lost uh, the Bucks and Kenny and Cody, like they they made new stars with Coda and Jay White stepping up. So uh, Osprey became a, a big breakout star for them. In terms of match quality, it, nothing touched New Japan this year, from at least from what I watched. Um, and business wise, they had a good year as well. I mean, it was such a good year that they feel they can run two two nights of Wrestle Kingdom in 2020 so they they had they came to america more and uh, overall new japan a, a strong year i agree I, I like the gcw uh gcw shout out yeah they um they are not for everybody but they bring something unique and they yeah like, comparatively to roh it feels like a hot company when you watch it um you know, they got a lot of stuff on fight tv now they're drawing well live they're apparently doing really good numbers for fight tv so yeah, I mean, I I think that's a yeah. Janela, Janela says that the GCW shows do better than the Impact shows on Fight TV. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but well, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily doubt it because the GCW audience is all online. There are still people that buy Impact pay per views through traditional pay per view, so that's a split there. But I mean, no, I, I don't doubt that they do better than a lot of stuff because they have a big online buzz and they are catering to that audience well. So I think that's a good shout out. Uh, I'm gonna go trip away for my first honorable uh, mention. I've liked a lot of trip away stuff this this year. Haven't got to watch as much of it as I would like, but uh, every time I'm tuning in, I'm finding some stuff I like uh, and just enjoying a lot of it. Uh, next up, Impact Wrestling. They are continuing to improve. Uh, another rebound year. They're selling some more tickets. They're running some slightly bigger venues. Their pay per views have all been good to great again this year. Uh, I think they're making a lot of positive improvements, and now they have the Access TV thing, which the Anthem owns. So I think uh, Impact, another strong year. Still a lot of work to go, but I think another strong year of improvement that should be recognized. Uh, my number three, I'm going WWE. Now listen, I know WWE makes billions of dollars on the TV deal, and business-wise, nobody can topple WWE. They're always going to be number one in that regard. Unfortunately, this also takes into account quality of the product. And outside of NXT, I think a lot of the general WWE product quality is shit. Don't enjoy it. Raw is a fucking drag. Um, 800 cuck angles with Mike and Maria and Rusev and Lashley and all this shit. And yeah, I just don't enjoy a lot of the WWE product. The funny thing is like, I love NXT. And if you would separate NXT, obviously it would smoke the rest of this. But NXT is what keeps the WWE for me from being that in the millions of dollars aspect keeps it from being uh, really low on the list. So it's funny. I enjoy NXT and NXT UK. And there were times where I was loving 205 Live just way more than the the main WWE products. But it's just that 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 Raw and SmackDown portion and some of these pay-per-views that like start good then end out average at best just drag the overall promotion down for me. Again, from a money-making standpoint, nobody's going to topple them because of these TV deals, and I fully understand that, but when you take everything into account, they're middle of the pack for me. Um, And much like you, Jeremy, I go AEW in there. Um, Again, a promotion that was not existing technically at this point last year. They come to life. They got a TV deal. They ran uh, three pay-per-views this year that did... Uh, roughly 300,000 buys combined. Um, so, I mean, that's the shit that nobody else was doing. They're selling decently weekly TV. They're selling out for pay-per-views. And um, the fact that they're only 12 weeks into TV, but they've accomplished so much throughout the year, I think they deserve a lot of praise for that. 
Again, they are far from a perfect company, but they've done a lot so far in this first year, which I greatly recognize. Again, WWE's going to smoke them in terms of fucking making money. And they're going to smoke everybody in that regard. But I think AEW definitely deserves a high mention, and I've enjoyed a ton of what they've done this year. A ton of what they've done that isn't Dark Order and Brandy Rhodes. I will say that. Uh, And uh, number one for me as well, New Japan Pro Wrestling. I know some people will cry this year about uh, New Japan being a little too repetitive throughout the year. But this was also a year of adjustment. They had to, you know, they didn't have access to Adam Page anymore or Cody. Uh, They lost Omega and the Bucks. Uh, They scaled back on the ROH relationship. But um, they made more money this year than they did last year. The gates are up as compared to last year. You have Kota Ibushi locked in. Uh, Shingo really broke out a lot during the year. Will Ospreay was fucking awesome all year. And uh, yeah, for me, um, it New Japan fits a lot more of my personal taste, but I think that they were the number one company, in my opinion, in 2019. Fair. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. New Japan had a had another excellent year from in-ring to everything. Yeah, so again, but and like I get that people are going to say that they were a bit repetitive and stuff, and I understand that, and I agree to a point, but... Business was still really good, and they still got a lot accomplished this year. And uh, now we have uh, double days of Wrestle Kingdom coming up. So there you go. Yeah, gonna uh, be uh, gonna be something with Wrestle Kingdom. Yep. All right. So next up, most outstanding performer of 2019. This is not Wrestler of the Year. This is who was the best bell to bell in ring performer in 2019, Jeremy. That is what we are looking at. Because Wrestler of the Year historically is more of a who was also a draw and who made a big deal for business. And that's really hard to account for these days in 2019 when not everybody releases uh, their financial stuff. And, you know, like WWE, it's like there's nobody in WWE that's really a discernible draw over someone else because it's more the brand. So we're doing Most Outstanding Performer. Do you want me to go first or you want to go? You can go first on this one. I think we're going to end up agreeing on the top name, but go ahead. Probably. Okay, I have several honorable mentions because I loved a lot of people this year. I'm going to start off, I know a lot of people might be surprised, but if you watch his stuff outside of NXT UK, you understand Jordan Devlin. He had some fucking tremendous matches in OTT and other places this year. Really top-level stuff. Plus, when he's on NXT UK, he's one of the best guys on that promotion. So he is my first honorable mention. Next up, Adam Cole, baby. Um, Adam Cole, always delivering top-tier matches. Didn't work as much as a lot of the other people on the list, which is the only thing that is keeping him as low on the list as he is. But again, you look at his top-tier stuff, you cannot argue with the overall quality of Adam Cole in 2019. Uh, Sticking with uh, NXT and WWE, uh, Walter. Big Daddy Walter. Tons of great stuff this year outside of NXT. He had the absolute match of the year candidate with uh, Tyler Bate at TakeOver. Just a lot of great stuff. Love him, and uh, he can do a lot more, obviously. And uh, we'll see how good he is and if he can carry Joe Coffey to a great match here in January. Because if he does, he is a lord among men. Uh, Next up, David Starr. You look at some of the shit he's done this year with Jordan Devlin, Walter, and everything. Uh, just great, great, great top level stuff from David Starr working around the world against a shit ton of different people. So he definitely deserves some mention. Uh, Okada is next, uh, reigning on top in New Japan. Tons of great to excellent matches all year. Once again, uh, you can't go wrong with Big Kaz Okada. Uh, going to All Japan, I haven't watched as much All Japan, but catching up on what I have been able to catch up late in the year. Kenta Miyahara, just um. He's kind of like their ace. He's their Tanahashi. Fucking, he doesn't do anything. He's not a spots guy. He doesn't do anything overly crazy. He just puts together great to excellently crafted professional wrestling matches. And uh, yeah, I wish I had more time for All Japan. Like if I didn't have to watch Raw and SmackDown, I'd be covering All Japan much more. Uh, number two on my list should be a surprise to nobody. Big Tom Ishii. A year of bangers, just fucking working great with everybody. D- dragging Tai Chi to great matches, making him work hard and stop his bullshit. 
just Big Tom is a guy that unfortunately they don't they're not going to do a lot of top level stuff with. His job is just to go out there and have great matches all year, which he does. And number one should be no surprise to anybody. The most outstanding performer of 2019, Will Ospreay. Uh, when my list of top matches of the year come out, you will understand why. Will Ospreay, to me, nobody touched his top-level stuff. He had a great year as a singles. He had excellent matches all year as a single. He had the run in Best of Super Junior, which was outstanding. Uh, win win record-wise, he wasn't great in the G1, but he had excellent matches in the G1. And then he even had that uh, underrated little tag run with Robbie Eagles putting on great tag team matches. Uh, so I'm sure if he would have found a way to go back in time, he would have competed in the Young Lions Cup this year if he could have. But uh, Osprey was just outstanding all year long. And honestly, I think that if you're one of those people that are still Will Osprey is no good and just a flippy guy, you haven't really watched his matches in 2019 because he's greatly evolved as a performer. And I really don't think there's much of an argument with Will Osprey at number one this year. No, Will Ospreay is my top pick as well. Uh, spoiler alert before I do the honorable mention. Sorry that I'm going out of order here, Larry. I'll but, allow it. <laughs> yeah, Ospreay was just outstanding from, from start to finish, starting with the Wrestle Kingdom match against uh, Ibushi and then going forward until the the end of this year um, with everything he accomplished in between, yeah, the tag matches with with Robbie Eagles at the end of this year have, have been spectacular, and he's it, this Hiromu match is is going to be absolutely nuts at, at Wrestle Kingdom, like just absolutely fucking lutely nuts. Um, so overall, just Will Osprey, yeah, the G one run, the, the New Japan Cup stuff, um, the Best of Super Juniors, like he he was excellent. I can't. Nobody touched Will Ospreay this year. Nobody touched Will Ospreay. Uh, my honorable mentions, Adam Cole, as you said, outstanding year, start to finish as well. Um, the the Gargano stuff um, th- throughout the year that carried, then Champa returning at the end of the year, the War Games, the, the, the Survivor Series, a couple of weeks, just everyone he wrestled. Like That was uh, just a, a special, special run that, that he was able to do. So, yeah, good stuff by Adam Cole this year. I, I don't watch as much like All Japan and stuff as you do. Um, Okada, you can never go wrong with Okada and everything he does. The only complaint I really had about Okada this year is he wrestled Sonata too much. That last match wasn't necessary. Always a good match, though. I there's a rare, rare time where Kazuchika Okada has a bad match, and uh, that speaks to his performance level and, and consistency throughout the year. And my final honorable mention uh, to, to go with a name you did not include is Cody. Cody was awesome this year. Did not wrestle as much as the other guys on this list, but every time he did wrestle, I felt it was good. Uh, the the one match I didn't like was the the tag team match with Dustin and the Bucks that went too long, but uh, on top of just him wrestling, like his character work was so excellent this year. Just everything he did, I uh, connected with me in in AEW, and I mean to me, he's their biggest star. And so, and again, th- this is just wrestling bell to bell stuff. I think his matches worked well this year the dustin match is one of my my favorites of the year the guevara match the darby match the jericho match like all of these were outstanding matches and you know cody was excellent in all of them so i'm going cody with an honorable mention i think that's a fine choice dude i'm not gonna argue with you it's first of all it's your list but yeah cody did a a lot of great stuff this year so i have no problem with that so Next up, we are going to look at the best weekly TV shows of the year, Jeremy. All right. Uh, Number one, no honorable mentions, ROH. You are such a horrible liar. (laughs) How dare you? This is a great year for ROH. Uh, All right. Honorable mention is going to be MLW. I think their weekly television has been fantastic. Um, You know, it's all on YouTube. I I don't get a chance to watch it new every single week, but 
they they've got interesting storylines they've got interesting characters they're not afraid to to do stuff that's a little bit different like the selena de, de la renta produced show the, the jimmy havoc produced show you get a little bit of everything from mlw their their inset promos or their their vignettes are really good with uh i mean it's mainly the dynasty but like they're awesome um and the the hard foundation do do some good ones as well and injustice have done some good promos so really like what mlw has done on youtube second is going to be as i try to find where i'm at on my list um i will i will say nwa power it was it didn't have the longest run in the world but it was a, a good show especially with the the promo work like the cornet commentary didn't really bother me i i think jim Cornette is actually excellent as a is a commentator and added a lot to power so i i think jim Cornette, again nwa power a, a very strong weekly TV show. And for some reason, I'm missing my my third one. Oh, Impact. I liked Impact this year. Some of their stuff was wacky, and uh, it didn't quite it didn't quite connect with me early because I thought they were just trying to create a different kind of universe that. I, I didn't I was like, all right, this shouldn't be happening in the Impact universe. But they kept doing it and kept doing it to where. It, they, they turned it into their own universe and they were able to blend elements of like Lucha Underground, blend elements of WWE, blend elements of, of uh, peak ROH with actual good wrestling and stuff. They were able to to do that. And essentially at first I would thought like, all right, you're trying to do too much. You're trying to be too many things. Just be you. And by the end of the year, they did it with such consistency and it was good that it was like, all right, you know what? They're, their impact. They've created their own universe with, with what they're doing. So I, I really enjoyed impacts weekly television product. Uh, number one is going to be NXT. They were consistent from start to finish this year. Once they moved to two hours, they, they ramped it up even more. It's always a great program on uh wednesday nights like it's just from start to finish it flies by it, it helps that it goes against aew i think because wednesday nights i mean we do our weekly podcast and we rave about the shows every single week but nxt has been on television or at least WWE network all year and it's been great all year so nxt is my top weekly show fair enough all makes sense uh i'm gonna go honorable mentions first obviously uh nwa power short run at the end of the year but i thought uh it brought a different niche uh, to the business here. The throwback studio feel. It's a, uh, it's refreshing for a lot of older time fans who were looking for something like that. And it's finding a new audience to some people that are kind of getting into it. I think that it's been fun. They you know they hit pay per view. They had a good pay per view, and uh, I, I like Power overall. I think they do a lot of things right, and it's um. There, there's nothing wrong. I'm not going to tell you that the wrestling on the show is spectacular every week because it's not. But you're going to get a lot of good promo stuff. And there, there's nothing wrong with a show that is going back to the basics. Uh, NXT UK is a show that is always solid but unspectacular. So I'm going to give them a nod because that show is a show that, while I understand a lot of people don't watch and a lot of people are willing to skip, that's also a show that never makes me angry. It never pisses me off. It's never stupid. It doesn't make me regret That's watching. because nothing happens on that show. You wouldn't know. You don't watch. You're not allowed to comment. I do watch. It's you so lie. boring. You, you told me last week when we were talking on the podcast, you said, I don't watch that show. I tried watching it, and then I got so bored by it that I was like, I don't know how anybody does this. You are a horrible person. I'm going to send Walter <laughs> after you. No, Please don't. I'll punch him like Stokely did. It's a perfectly fine show. It doesn't annoy me, so it gets an odd. Uh, MOW Fair Fusion, enough. I agree with you. I, I think it's largely a good show. Uh, they try to do some different stuff. Um, it's it's weird because they'll have a string of weeks where it's like a really good show, and then they're gonna then they have like a a weird off week, like the other week when they had this like show that just wasn't good and featured a fucking swamp fight, which was like in a abandoned parking lot with Savio Vega and Leo Bryan. It was like the stupidest thing I've seen. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, MLW Fusion definitely gets an odd. Uh, I think Impact Wrestling definitely had a extremely solid year on TV. 
Uh, sometimes just okay, sometimes really good, uh, but largely consistent, and also a show that rarely angers me. Uh, they had a short run. I'm going to put AEW Dynamite in the honorable mention mix because it's a show that I think is good to great every week. It flies by. It's largely enjoyable. Um, not perfect by any means. Enjoy the hell out of Dynamite. We'll watch it all the time, even with the Dark Order over Raw and SmackDown. So, no problem there. And like you, I go NXT TV number one. They're going to edge out everything else because they ran all year. Um, larger scorecard in terms of consistency and good to great shows. Delivering really good matches and everything and big moments like this uh, last week with the Ray Ripley title win. So, yeah, I think easily for me, NXT number one this year. I left off AEW because of those punches thrown by the Dark Order guy. Okay. <laughs> that shit's pissed off everybody online. I don't care because like I didn't even, okay, I didn't notice it number one, but the other thing was it's like everybody's noticing it cuz a clip went out and everybody is like, "Oh, now we need to slow it down and break it down frame by frame." Yes, it was shitty punches. You know what else was shitty punches? Every time Shane McMahon appeared on TV in 2019. How dare you uh, speak ill of the greatest striker in wrestling history? The problem is, is The Undertaker is the greatest striker in uh, no, sports entertainment no. history. He's the he's the greatest technical striker. Shane McMahon, he's the, the greatest, greatest when you te- when you combine striker when you combine technical uh, precision. And and power as well. His precision is precise, in the words of the great Mike Goldberg. Sure. <laughs> I don't get the big deal over those uh, bad punches either. It's just stuff happens. My like, whatever. I think was, it became a bigger deal. My favorite thing was fucking Silas Young from ROH going on Twitter and saying, Hey, ROH, we should go live every week because I guarantee you we wouldn't have botches like this. Meanwhile, Please. This, meanwhile, this is a company that fucking employs Mandy Leon, who wrestles in slow motion. And then the best part is somebody fucking uh, retweeted a gif of her trying to punch people after that. So I was like, yes, thank you. Good. You did my job. Please let ROH go live every week. <laughs> they would win best weekly show if that happened. Oh, uh, so... <laughs> That was bad, but yeah, the, those types of things happen all the time. Remember there was that video of uh, the um, last year, the women's brawl before Survivor Series, and it's like Dana Brooke and Carmella like uh, tickling each other and laughing, and people like, nobody made a big deal about that, but yeah, it's it happens, like whatever. I think what made it worse is just Mark Henry commented on it, and then Randy Orton was shitting all over it. Uh, the good guy Tamatanga was calling out Enzo over it. And then even Dustin was like, yeah, this shouldn't have happened. And like, I mean, Dustin was the guy who was mounted. So uh, it made it worse, those guys just kind of commenting on it. Yeah, I just, I don't care. All right, let's talk about more good stuff, Jeremy. The best matches of 2019. And I'm going to deliberately go out of order, but uh, these are all in my top 10 for the year that will be appearing on the list here on the site coming up. I will go first, Jeremy. Uh, NXT TakeOver New York, Johnny Gargano, Adam Cole was on my list. NXT UK TakeOver Cardiff, Walter and Tyler Bate is on my list. New Japan Cup Day 3, Tatsuya Naito and Kota Ibushi is on my list. OTT 5th Anniversary, Jordan Devlin and David Starr is on this list. And New Japan Best Super Junior Finals, Will Ospreay and Shingo Takagi on my list. These are all on my top 10 portion of the year. Um, So when that list comes out, you'll get the exact order. And just for clarification, so you know, these are also all matches I went 5 stars on this year. Because no offense to Dave, I don't do that over 5 star bullshit. You're a man of honor. So, but those are my top matches of the year, Jeremy. You don't have. You're not going to reveal number one. You're going to make the people wait for the column. I'm going to make people wait for the column, brother. I can't give it all away on the podcast. All right. I will. I will tell I'm going to give that, you. I will tell you that these are all in my top ten, though. 
All right. I'm going to give you one honorable mention and then my actual top match. Because I like you pay more attention to the the technical wrestling and, and that stuff. I don't do five star matches. I do just what the matches that I like. I, I'm very pass or fail kind of grade. Um, so yeah, like I'm sure there's some great Okada and uh, Osprey, Okada and Ibushi, Ibushi Osprey. Like all that stuff is great. Uh, are some better than others? Yes, but at the end of the day, like. They're just all great matches to me. And I, I'm not the person you can look towards of like, this was a five-star match. This was a four-and-a-half-star match. I don't know the difference. It's a it's quarter of a star or half a star. See, I don't know the difference. All right. Honorable mention, Cody against Dustin. Absolutely love this match. Made me feel things that should not be felt in wrestling sometimes. Uh, just the the overall story of this match. And, and that's what I, I really look towards is... You know what kind of story is this telling, and the the blade job pl- played a big part into it. Just the emotion that both men put into it, and the emotion behind it. I mean, they were cut off of a WrestleMania bout. They, this match was not good enough for like a, a B pay per view, and then here they are on the the first AEW show, and they're like, we're gonna go out there and prove why this could have headlined WrestleMania, and they wouldn't have been able to do this match in a headline wrestlemania but it just proved that hey both of these guys can still connect with the audience both of these guys can tell a story and the work was good yeah there was a botch or two don't care like the for the most part the work was good and the botch can play into it guy was losing blood guys is 50 years old doesn't quite have it as much anymore it all worked for me absolutely love this excellent professional wrestling match loved it as well yes uh, my top match is Tyler Bate against Walter uh, from from Takeover Cardiff because the match fucking ruled. Um, if you listen to our post Takeover, that was a long day too. That that was AEW. That was um, NXT Takeover, and that was the New Japan England show yeah. as well. And and it was a CM Punk interview on Fight from Starcast. It was a very long day. But if you listen to that. You will hear me rave about that match. I called it the the best match of the weekend, and I mean that was that was a really good weekend, full of, full of great stuff. Um, and, and that was the that was the same weekend as the Cody and Dustin match, wasn't it? Uh yeah, yeah. That was so uh, that go. was the, the AEW All Out weekend and Royal Quest, which had the excellent Suzuki Okada match, and then you. Had, oh, that was uh, that was All Out. So yeah, never yeah. mind. Okay. Oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Fuck, that was all I can't out. The, the now, now I'm being confused. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I know there's there's so much wrestling. Um, yeah, I, but regardless, I thought that was the best match of the weekend, and I thought it was the best match of the year. I love the Tyler Bate Walter match. It was long, did not feel that long. I thought the ending was just absolutely like I cannot say enough great things about that ending, where where it looks like Bates making this big comeback. And the the crowd is doing the the Tyler Bate chant and everything, and Walter just murders this man and pins him, and the crowd just goes silent. And it wasn't a silence of like, oh, that was the finish. Like, what the fuck? Like that? Like that sucked. Like I like I think a lot of promotions have had that this year of like, oh, that that was a weak finish or whatever. It was that silence of, holy shit! Like we were behind this guy, and then he just got killed. And now we're just like, we have no words. Like we can't say anything. Like it was that kind of silence. Yeah. So I absolutely love Bate and Walter. And yeah, that's my top match of the year. I agree in terms of that finish, how that played so well. And I, uh, like I went back over the weekend here and I've, I rewatched my top 10 for the end of the year. So I could, you know, do proper uh, repositioning and decide what was going to be number one and everything. And yeah, I sat there and went to rewatch that, and then I, I put it on. And I realized like, fuck, this is like a forty minute match, isn't it? Like I had just remembered that, and then I watched it again, and even on replay, it does not feel that long. So it it really that that's what really is going to make that match stand out to others. Is to me is that 
it still has a high rewatch value even though it's that long. Because even on the rewatch, it doesn't feel that long. I know the finish, I know what's coming, but it still didn't feel long. So that's that gives it a leg up on a lot of the other matches that are going to end up in my top 10. And that's what helped it uh, rate so highly on my list as well. So yeah, I uh, I love that match. That was, that was great. Um, just... You know, it's again. It's one of those matches that happened in August, and it's still gonna. It's still resonating at the end of the year because, as I was going through my list and stuff, and like trying to move things around, I'd be like, "Well, maybe this one's gonna be up here." Then I'd be like, "Well, there's that fucking Walter Tyler Bate match," you know. And so I'd just like be repositioning and moving things down. So yeah, that that match. I'm not gonna disagree with anybody that wants to call that their match of the year at all because I think it has everything that makes it worthy of it. If that's not your number one, you're wrong, Larry. Wrong. Uh, you you're wrong. No. <laughs> you can find. Well, I look out. for it. When does when does your yeah when does your match of the year column come out? Okay, my 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 columns start running Christmas Day, and I'm breaking down what ended up, and I'll tell you here in a second as I open up the uh, open up the old uh, fucking. What the hell is this thing called? The the WordPress system here. Okay, my my overall my top uh, matches run on the thirtieth of December, and they start running the twenty fifth. It ended up being the top sixty four matches of the year because the cutoff was four and a half stars. Anything under that was not getting talked about, and um, I put the close on the end of the year a little early so I could start focusing on next year like I always do. So, and I went back and watched a lot of stuff and added to the list. But, uh, yeah, starts Christmas Day, ends on the 30th, and you will find out my match of the year on that day. Enjoy. All right. I look forward to it. So, a, lot of, a lot of great stuff to look back on this year, man. It was, uh, you know, just kind of sk- skimming through as I was reorganizing that, that list. I was like, God damn, it was a really great year. So, all right. Next up, Jeremy, we're going to do the most overrated performers of 2019. And for this category, just for a little uh, clarification, this is the wrestler who gets the biggest push despite lacking the proper in-ring ability or charisma to match that push. Okay. An honorable mention is Dolph Ziggler. Preach! I I don't even know why this guy's on TV still. Uh, it does just nothing for me, and yet he's there every week. He's in a top position every week, and I, I don't, I, I don't get it. I, I really, I just don't understand it. But he's, he's there for some reason. Second, Forgotten Sons, please just get them off my television just more guys who like they don't get the biggest push in the world, but they're still just like featured weekly. And I don't understand why, because they're they're They, they don't do anything for me. They're, it's not like they're great wrestlers. Their, their gimmick kind of sucks. Like their gimmick is literally, we're so boring that you've forgotten about us and we're mad about it. That's their gimmick, Larry. Uh, yeah, I I I don't, you're not wrong. (laughs) I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I just, they don't need to be on TV. There's so much talent in NXT. Like, just use that spot for, for somebody else who can actually get over and do something with it. So, yeah, not, not a fan of them. These fuckers uh, are on TV while Kushida is doing jobs. Yeah. Come yeah. on. I, I don't get it, but... Uh, that, that's a that's a rare miss for NXT. NXT does a lot of things right. That's a definite miss for them. Um, next is a a combination. I'm gonna combine these two, and, and that's Sean Spears and Brandy. I I get why Brandy is on television. She's completely miscast in the role that she's in. Because she she's not good as this cult leader or whatever she's trying to be. Her promo work's not good. The story's not good. And, and Sean Spears, I just I have absolutely I don't have much time for him to be honest. Um, 
and taking the top spot. And I think she is a lovely person, but it's Lacey Evans. I don't know what is seen in her, honestly. Like, I think she's fine as a heel, but then they tried to position her as like a threat to Becky, and they did that for like three months, and it just completely killed everything Becky had coming out of WrestleMania. And now she's a babyface, and like the whole, all right, I'm a family woman type of thing. Like, there was no real explanation for the turn outside of just, all right, I'm friends with Natalia now. And so we're, it, it's cool, it's good. And like her work isn't good as far as in ring and the, the character just feels all over the place. And yet she's on television each week. And like she's in big feuds too. like, all right, Natalia is on TV uh, a fair amount and maybe she could be on this list as well. But like Lacey, it feels like it's taking up just way more spots. So I don't know. I don't get the Lacey Evans thing. I agree. Not, not going to argue with you at all. My list, I also start with Dolph Ziggler. I have no time for Dolph. Does nothing for me. He's just a fucking dude wearing his little fox hat. Go away. Uh, Next up, Natalia. I just laugh every time she's on screen. And they sit here and they try to tell me how she's this revolutionary, legendary figure in the fucking women's division. Who has had probably maybe two what I would call great matches in her entire run and then a bunch of boring bullshit that I care not to remember just always on my fucking TV go away going to NXT UK Joe Coffee. this motherfucker's about the main event another takeover and he is boring and bland and as average as they come He had a bland match with Pete Dunne last year. And that's really hard to do. So we're going to find out how good the Big Daddy Walter is here in January, Jeremy. I got faith in Walter. What's that? I got faith in Walter. Well, I'm just saying, if he has a great match with Joe Coffey, he is a fucking deity. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I got faith in him. Uh, Next up, I'm going to New Japan. Bad Luck Fale. No time for this motherfucker either this year. Put in the laziest goddamn efforts I've seen all year long. His shit in World Tag League was embarrassing this year. So bad. But yet, he's always around. No time for bad luck, Fowley. I agree with you. Lacey Evans is on my list, too. Just um, pushing her, pushing her, pushing her. There's no defined character other than... I'm going to be a baby face now. Uh, she just had lackluster matches with Becky that did nothing. And, you know, it's like they're going to try to correct course here and make her a baby face and play off of, you know, changing the world and making, um, making peace in the Middle East because she wrestled in Saudi Arabia. And, yeah, and the sad thing is her daughter's already a better performer than her because her daughter was awesome on SmackDown. I should put the titles on her daughter. All of them. Women's titles, men's yeah. titles. I don't care. Her Just daughter, Mean Mug and Sasha, was fucking hilarious. Yeah. It was so good. And uh, number one on my list, I am going with uh, the King don't Corbin. Don't say it. Don't say Oh, I knew you were going to say it. Uh, yeah, I, Again, I think Baron Corbin is probably a nice and cool dude, but I just, uh, he got a big shot all summer long with the Seth feud. And he did not deliver once in that feud. And he's always on my TV. He's always talking. He never sounds like a human being. Nobody in WWE sounds like a human being. Well, I know, but I'm just saying. Yeah, so it's just, uh, I'm sorry. I got no time for King Corbin. Probably a lovely gentleman. Can't do it. So Fair. I... I'm a little bit nicer to, to King Corbin than you. I Does he deserve to be in the spot that he's in? Maybe not. Is he good in the role that he's in? And, you know, the, the King of the Ring stuff I thought was, was good. Um, 
even some of the Seth stuff, I didn't think it was, it was too terrible. But yeah, I, I understand the King Corbin stuff. I've, I've turned the corner on him after the King of the Ring win. And so I think that's why I'm a little bit uh, nicer. But there was a lot before. And that was not good. Yeah. So again, and again, I'm not putting it all on him either because a lot of it has obviously been the creative. So. All right. So we did overrated. Now we go to underrated, Jeremy. This is, uh, for clarification, the wrestler with the most ability who, for whatever reason, doesn't get to push uh, commensurate with their ability. This should be based on this past year and not overall, like, prior years combined. So, I'll go first for this one. I am going to go, actually, Killer Kelly, who works NXT UK sometimes, who I think is really good, but they just seem to have no idea what to do with her other than jobbing her to bland people like Jenny and Nina Samuels. Feel bad for her. Think she could be cool and do a lot. Who uh, are these people? You go, I thought you watched NXT TV. <laughs> what the fuck, Jeremy? Ha <laughs> Outed as a fake NXT UK user. Are you a fucking Tory too? <laughs> Uh, I had to keep the, the NXT UK bashing gimmick alive. I look, I've heard of them. I can't tell you a single thing they've done. But if you tell me that Killer Kelly is underrated, I believe you. Yeah, I like her a lot. Uh, next up, Desmond, Desmond Xavier from Impact. They, uh, I like the Rascals. I like a lot of what they're doing. They brought Des in. He won the little Super X Cup thing. And it seemed like they were building some cool stuff around him and then just totally fucking dropped it. Uh, I think they could do a lot more with him as a single. Unfortunately, that's going to Trey right now. So they can do the Trey has a quote-unquote hot mom angle with Ace Austin. and It is what it is. Uh, again, I like the Rascals and stuff. It's a good, fun unit. But I think they could do a lot more with Dez. Uh, Ilya Dragunov, NXT UK as well. Guy that uh, showed he's had some great matches this year against Alexander Wolf. Had the great match with Cesaro. And he's fucking hanging out with Gallus now. Which, just a bunch of fucking geeks. So. Uh, Grand Metallic makes my list. Um, he made it last year as well. Just a guy who was infinitely talented. And everybody said, there's no way WWE will use him worse than New Japan used him. And Vince said, hold my beer, motherfuckers. He's a Mexican with a mask. I have no time for him. So. <laughs> He's just a fucking dude that they do nothing with, despite being an excellent worker and could be a lot of fun. Uh, Cesaro is another guy that makes my list seemingly every year. I think they totally missed a boat with him not doing a run in NXT UK with him and trying to prop up that brand and giving Cesaro like a sense of purpose. Really think that they should have done more with him. And number one is a guy that they keep teasing doing shit, Jeremy. Teasing shit to do with... But they never do it. Drew McIntyre. Yeah. When are they going to do something with my boy Drew? I've I've given up on them doing something with, with Drew McIntyre, honestly. Like, we, we've talked about it ad nauseum on this podcast throughout the year. It's just that it seems like they're going to get behind him, and then they just don't. And... I just, I, I'm not convinced it's ever going to happen. All right. Hit me up with your list. Okay. Honorable mention numero uno. Joey Janela. Uh, when this guy came into AEW, I had big expectations because, I mean, anybody who's followed his indie work knows just how good that was. He is, I, I called him a visionary earlier on this podcast. I like his vignettes are great. He's a good talker. He's a great character. He can get himself over. Like I thought this was going to be a breakout guy for AEW and they've done nothing with him. They've given him like no promo time. The, the one good pro like he had a, that good social media promo uh, to build up the Moxley match, but they weren't on TV yet. So no one really saw it. Um, and then they they gave him that promo backstage uh, prior to the Moxley match on Dynamite, and Moxley just came in and was like, "Eh, kids," like just completely dismissive. 
and then he's facing Sean Spears and like you're you're not you're not getting over facing Sean Spears. I think Janela should be in a, a much better position than he is on AEW right now. So go on Janela right there. I'm with you on Ilya Dragnilov. Um, he the the match against Cesaro at Takeover was awesome. He should be doing more. Look, I do. If I don't watch NXT UK, I do read your reports, Larry, because I love you. I don't have time for Gallus. They suck. I don't know why uh, Ilya is not doing more. I, I think the lack of a mid-card title might hurt there because he would be kind of perfect for, for that role. But even if you're not going to do that, he would be perfect to, to face Walter in, instead of Coffee because that match, it, it'll probably be good because Walter's awesome. But if it was Dragnilov, it would be much fucking better. So I'm I'm with you on him. Uh, my my third one is Cedric Alexander. Um, they they do like he's done well, but at the same time he could just be doing more. The AGA feud left a lot to be desired just in how he was booked. He just lost it every turn, and now he's like on main event. You don't even see him anymore. The the bit where he was the janitor. And he helped Roman Reigns, but he still lost. And then he's like laughing afterwards. and like, ha, 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 we still lost, even though we kind of got you, but you beat us. And I I don't know. Like, it's just they should be doing more with Cedric. That, that guy's a, a top talent in the ring. I understand his, his uh, character work, maybe not so much, um, but... You know that's on the writing team to to give him something to do, so he's a little bit uh, positioned better in, in that one. Um, and then my my number my number one is kind of a combination of guys. All right, so it, it's it's the heart and the soul of two hundred five live, and, and it's Ali and, and Buddy Murphy because it looked like they were in for a big breakout year. And, you know, they're, they're beating Daniel Bryan, Ali. He was supposed to have the, the gauntlet run and the chamber that ended up going to Kofi, but he got hurt. You know, Buddy was involved in the Roman storyline, and he beat Bryan. And then they just, nothing happened with them. Ali, you wouldn't even realize he, he was there for most of this year. Buddy just got dropped, and, I mean, he's doing the feud with Alistair now, which is good, but, like, both of these guys were just standouts on 205 live and it showed they can carry uh, a division and a show even though no one really watched it but like, they could be doing so much especially ali like this guy is just his his vignettes are fantastic his, his in-ring work is obviously spectacular like this is a guy you you could really build somebody a uh you could really build something into and they just haven't done anything with them so it's a combo of ali and buddy Morf murphy more ali I, I definitely think you know it sucks that he got injured and didn't get that gauntlet run and the elimination like it led to kofi mania and that was one of the top moments of the year um but it, it sucks for ali because he got nothing to do after that and like he's awesome I agree completely. I think those are very good choices all around, man. <clears throat> so, all right, we're going to close up and we're going to keep it uh keep it positive as we close up, Jeremy. The feel good stories of 2019 and I always like to talk about this because I mean, honestly, when we're breaking down wrestling, we have to be critical at times and I don't always want it to come off as boo-hoo, we hate this, we hate that, because that's obviously not the case. Um, there all, obviously are tons of good things that happen in wrestling, and we're going to talk about some of them here. I will go first. Uh, my first in the line of honorable mentions is uh, I love that Tony Schiavone has found his love of wrestling again because Tony got really shit on at the end of WCW, and he was obviously checked out by the end of WCW, which you can't blame him for at all. And he's come back, and he was doing MLW, and he's doing AEW. And, like, on Wednesdays, he's, he just sounds like he is having the best time in the world. And he seemed to just hate and resent the wrestling business for a long time. 
So I'm really happy for him that he's found that love again because that, that's great. I think that is so good for him. So it makes me happy that Tony Schiavone's happy. Uh, the rebirth of the NWA is the next one for me. I, I think it's really cool to see the NWA, which for me was very important growing up in my original fandom as a wrestling fan. Seeing it come back, and I think that that is really good. Uh, after that, I have uh, the, the birth of AEW, honestly, I think is another good thing. It's going to help wrestlers get, um, you know, we're, we're seeing guys get bigger contracts. And I think that is good. It's going to give people bargaining chips. And it is giving us just more as wrestling fans, which I think is always a good thing. Uh, Kofi Kingston's WrestleMania story has to be up there as a feel-good moment for the year. Is in terms of just storyline for wrestling. In another year, I think it would get a lot more. Um, it would probably be much higher, but I definitely think it um, it deserves a spot here, kind of number three ish. Roman Reigns beating leukemia and coming back, I think, is obviously great, just because Roman is healthy and happy, and that is a great story. Again, I think that is another one in years that would probably win number one. Uh, For me personally, I'm going the return of Hiromu Takahashi from a broken neck. I think it's absolutely outstanding. I love Hiromu. It's going to lead to a big Wrestle Kingdom match. Um, I'm not going to argue with anybody that wants to go Roman Reigns over Hiromu or anything like that. Um, I think they're both great stories. I'm glad to see both guys back. I'm going Hiromu at number one, coming back from a broken neck. And he's going into a big match at Wrestle Kingdom, so it's awesome. My list is is very similar. Um, no real order on these. I, I have Horomo as an honorable mention because, uh, I mean, once you once you hear the number one, it'll be pretty obvious of why I think that's the the bigger deal. But Horomo, yeah, as you said, coming back from a broken neck, great to see him back. Horomo, always awesome in the ring, always connects with the audience in a way that just not many people can like you, you look at the guy and his gimmick and it doesn't seem like it it only works to you know it's not going to work everywhere i mean he's so good that it might but you look at it and you're like i don't get this but it's he gets a big reaction every time the daryl stuff is over like Everything he does is just completely over. I love Hiromu. Can't wait for the Wrestle Kingdom match. Just the the uh, the, the tag matches on Road to Tokyo Dome. Like he was still busting his ass in those. And like, yeah, th- this guy does not give a fuck. Like he's still going 100 miles an hour. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. But God bless Hiromu for still not changing that part of himself even though um we might be in like five years being like hey he probably should have slowed down but it's good to see him back regardless kofi kingston is another honorable mention for me and you know the the whole kofi mania story was just outstanding the guy waited 11 years to really get his shot he could have had a shot many years ago but randy orton he fucking pissed off the wrong guy and so he just got bumped down after that and it took some extenuating circumstances admittedly by all parties for for kofi to to be in that match and get that moment but you know what it happened and at the end of the day that's what matters um it's not like it was 100% earned, but I do think a feel-good moment is the women main eventing WrestleMania because, I mean, who would have thought that was going to happen in our lifetime, especially at the start of this decade? Like, at the, at the start of the decade, you would have been like, yeah, the, the women will be lucky to get, like, five minutes on WrestleMania unless it's a, a brawl and panties match or something. And at the, the end of the decade, I mean, they're, like – they rightfully main evented WrestleMania. So just the progress that they, that has been shown. And I, I realize this is only 2019, but a, a larger picture thing of it was a feel good moment for the, like it happened in this year. And it was a feel good moment because of the overall story, similar to, to Kofi. Um, and, and my, my last honorable mention will be just the birth of AEW and kind of everything that went along with it. So we're kind of just, grouping everything together so like that does include like shivani i i think mlw uh played a big part in that as well but shivani looks really just reinvigorated with with aew 
guys getting jobs that maybe they couldn't have gotten um, elsewhere, you know, just having the, the Wednesday night wars and just being able to watch like four hours of, of great wrestling every Wednesday that just like flies by. You got the rebirth of, of Dustin Rhodes, essentially. Like, how good has that guy been? Cody stepping up and becoming, like, this huge star. Chris Jericho turning into, like, reinventing himself again. And, and just what it's done for the overall industry of, of, you know, WWE guys getting bigger contracts. NXT going to television. Like, would NXT have gone to, to USA two hours every Wednesday if it wasn't for AEW? Maybe, but they certainly sped up the process. I think the, the consensus was going to be that, um, NXT was going to go to Fox sports for two hours and who knows like what the time slot would have been then. But you know, they got on a bigger network in, in USA and it's, you know, it does this happen without AEW and, and probably not like AEW has created a lot of, of top moments for, uh, for a lot of people this year. So I'm kind of all in, uh, encapsulating just a, the birth of AEW into a lot of good things for a lot of people. Number one is going to be Roman Reigns coming back from leukemia because I mean, the, the guy beat leukemia, like he came back and we didn't know when he was going to come back. The fact that he was able to do it so quickly, it was a very positive sign, a very good thing. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, this doesn't discount anybody else who came back from a big injury because there were plenty of people who got injured and came back and, and like it was it was a good moment this year. But like leukemia is a big deal. Roman Reigns is he's the top star in WWE, especially when he lost. Like he was the champion and he was gonna get this big push because he'd just beaten Brock Lesnar. Like he like this was a, a huge deal. And so the fact that he came back from it all and is still, you know, competing at a high level and doing well, like it's a it's a great thing to see. All right, fair enough, man. Again, I'm not gonna argue with you at all. I, I think it's I think a lot of years it would be a slam dunk for Roman at number one too, but I th- I think there's Obviously, ones you could debate this year, Rhonda, but it's a no doubt we had some really good feel good stories this year, which is fun to talk about. So I am happy about that. Yeah, it was a, I mean, a lot of good things happened in wrestling this year. And it's a shame that we're only going to focus on bad punches by a guy under a creeper mask. Exactly. So. All right, well, that is going to wrap up our awards portion of the show. Jeremy, I want to thank you as always, my friend. It was a good time. Uh, No Wednesday night podcast this week because of Christmas and stuff. So this is going to be the podcast for the week. And then we're going to be back next weekend as we break down Wrestle Kingdom. Uh, So look forward to that. Um, Oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. Get excited, (laughs) Jeremy. Oh, I'll down. be excited. Like I I love New Japan. I love Wrestle Kingdom. Like it's going to be a, a great, great weekend of wrestling. It's going to be fucking long as hell. And again, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun, but Jesus, is that gonna be a, a long weekend? <laughs> But yeah, we're going to preview it next weekend. So uh, next up, again, as I mentioned early in the show, Cubs fan is going to be on to talk some Lucha. And then Steve Cook and I will break down the airing of the 2019 Wrestling Grievances. So stay tuned for the next segment of the show. Okay, we're back with part two of the show. And I am joined by a returning guest, somebody people asked to have back. Uh, the man who is the one I follow for all my Lucha Libre co- coverage, the Cubs fan from the Lucha blog. Cubs, how are you? I'm feeling good. How are you feeling? Uh, not too bad. Can't complain, man. It's uh, the holidays, trying to get excited for Christmas with the kids and everything, and uh, wrapping up the year-end stuff here, and uh, looking forward to uh, getting into next year already. So it's a pretty good time. For what you're writing, do you have a lot of, like, matches left to go back and watch before the year ends and then you're just done with the year as soon as that calendar turns or are you all caught up already i'm i'm caught up and as of today which is the 22nd i've i've put the cut off on the year 
I've gone back and caught a bunch of stuff. I had a bunch of recommendations from friends and other reviewers. Uh, caught some stuff and added a couple things to my year end list. And I got my big year end list of top matches coming out starting on Christmas. And yeah, I um I pretty much try to get the end of uh, the year around the twentieth, so I don't have to continually go till the end of the year. So yeah, I'm actually wrapped up. I went back and caught up on a bunch of other stuff and like rewatched what I had is like my top 10 or 15 and then did some rearranging for that. And, uh, finally decided on a locked in list. I am so jealous. I'm looking at, I was looking at my, my watch later pile to still go through and there's still like 12 to 15 matches. And even going through those and, and mentioning them online, I got like three or four more recommendations of stuff I need to watch. And, and with Lutra, um, CML decided that Christmas is going to be a major show every year too. So I can't even Christmas and New Year's <laughs> day. So there's, there's no holiday break like everyone else gets. We just keep on going and going. Yeah. And the, the other thing that has to be hard for you is I know that like, um, I know a bunch of the Lucha stuff, like, if you're trying to dig deep and get everything, you have to, like, really dig for some of the stuff that doesn't make, like, traditional tape, right? Right. We have to go look down handhelds. Luckily, there's a, a site that has done a lot of the filming themselves for a lot of the indies around Mexico City. But even then, sometimes stuff fall through. Or, for whatever reason, they won't release the show until, like, two more shows have happened with that promotion. Oh. So stuff is later on. In fact, like... It, it, this is a deep lucha cut, but there was a show that happened in the spring that may have been like the best show that happened all year on an indie level. <clears throat> but there appears to be some sort of issue between the promoter and the people who filmed it. So it's just sitting on someone's hard drive all year and has like four or five matches we'd all like to watch, but we may never get to see it because they were the only people who taped it. Or it just may show up tomorrow. You never know with lucha. Jeez, yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, that's crazy. And it's so funny because like... I'm sure most of the listeners who just follow like the like the you know, the basic American stuff and maybe some Japan, it seems so weird in 2019 to still be dealing with that because everybody's really getting spoiled because you know like New Japan has a service, All Japan has a service, Dragon Gate and Stardom have a service, and you can even find like a bunch of Noah on YouTube for free. And like, what do you mean handhelds? What's a handheld? Like you know, kids these days? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's surprising how much stuff that we're still watching that's just taped off someone's phone or just a shaky, uh, just a shaky view of something. But I was working on a feature that I may or may not get done about like the ten, like the five biggest trends that we've seen this year in Lutra. And even though we're just getting on handheld, getting that far is just a giant leap from where things were at the beginning of the decade. It's behind everybody else, but there's so much more available now than there used to be. Yeah, it's a it overall it's like such an embarrassment of riches anymore because like you have all the US TV and as I mentioned all the Japan services and like CMLL does a couple shows a week like on YouTube and stuff then you have all the triple A stuff on Twitch and it's like if you just want to do nothing but watch wrestling you can do that now. Yeah, you you, you you could watch you could try to watch everything out there and you'd still wouldn't have time. Even you would not have time to watch I, everything that's I out there. And I admit I don't. I mean, I failed. Like people were like sending me match recommendations and like I saw a couple. I'm like, okay, that was like a fine, fun three star match. I'm like, don't even send me anything <laughs> unless it's four stars or above, please. I can't, I I can't deal with just an average good match anymore. It's like I don't have enough time. I want to watch more, and I just don't have that time. So it's like, only give me the great stuff. So- <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that too. When I recommend stuff, Lucha stuff to people, I it's like it has to hit a high bar just because if if it's not uh, like a four-star match or something, then people are just going to start tuning it out. It's just so much stuff to do. Yeah, and it's like, I want to watch more stuff, and I don't mind, like, a good match, but it's like, I, I want to focus on, like, what's really, really great. Like, like my year-end match list, I, I settled in an odd number for the list because I ended up cutting it off. Like, I'm not talking about the best of the year, anything under four and a half stars for me. Because it's yeah. like... There's great four star matches all the time, and four and a fourth is roughly the same. And it's, I just got to the point that, like, sure, I can whip out a list of like 200 matches, but it's like, okay, you're gonna cradle through like 100 four star matches. And, like, does anybody really, really gonna care about that and remember them all? So it's like, I had to settle on something, and that's just kind of what I did. And like, like when I did like my, my mid year list, it was like some weird number, like 16, and it was because all I did was like, 
th- four and three fourths and above, and it's like because nobody else really cares about all the other good stuff. I do that every month. You can catch that, but yeah, I'm just I'm trying to create like a, a playlist. Like if you miss 2019 in a coma, you can wake up and read my list, and like here's the 60 whatever matches you should watch. So. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think it's even better to have like that smaller number because when you do those two hundred match lists, they, you can list a lot of stuff and people will be happy to see their favorites on there. But no one's going to have the time to go or the inclination to go back and watch all two hundred matches. If you can narrow it down a bit, then people it might be a little bit more approachable for people to look at. Yeah, but it's a definitely an embarrassment of riches. We have so much fun stuff to watch, and there is always stuff going on in the lucha world. I keep I keep reading up on stuff. And first of all, I guess let's start with Sin Cara because Sin Cara got his WWE release, and then he appeared at a AAA show, and then I guess he changed his name. And there's some legal hullabaloo going on. What is exactly going on with the old Sin Cara here, man? Sin Cara came back and debuted at a AAA show last weekend, as uh, back on the 14th. Um, he came in and they they used it, he used this Sin Cara mask. They had a Sin Cara graphic on the screen, which looked straight off WAB TV. Um, I don't watch enough Sin Cara in WAB to know if he, they just even gave him his music, but I wouldn't be surprised. But sometimes AAA will do that sort of thing. Um, but it was obviously that was not going to hold up long t- over the long term because. WWE had the foresight years ago to trademark Sin Cara in Mexico, too, so no one else could use it. So he was going to have to change his name. He decided he wanted to change it to his old trainer's name, who was Cinta de Oro, who was a big star locally around Ciudad Juarez um, by El Paso, the, the border towns in Texas. Um he, he was a famous guy there. He, Cinta de Oro means gold ribbon. If you've watched um, Sincar the last few years, he's had this kind of ribbon across his mask that changed it from just looking like the old Mitsuko match. That it, has a, it looks a little bit different now. Um, he changed it in 2016 because the trainer passed away, so he wanted to memorialize him somehow. Um, and that's also the reason he's taking this name. The problem was that someone else had the legal rights to the name and someone else was using Sinta de Oro Jr., and it was a whole messy situation. It looks like Sin Cara is going to be able to use the Sinta de Oro name. But even then, I, I have to explain all this background why you would use Sinta de Oro. If you're a WB fan, even if you're a WB fan in Mexico, you know this guy is Sin Cara. So um, I think AAA would like him to use something a lot closer to his WB name. So I think the situation may change again. But right now he's trying to go to a different name to honor somebody else. It sounds very messy. <laughs> it's just yeah, and the complicated backstory—it's the even more complicated backstory because Sin Cara's whole story is that he was not the original Sin Cara in WB. It's the guy that we know as Mystico in CML, who's now Crisco, who was the first Sin Cara that he got fired, and then this guy took over. But even before they came to WB, this Sin Cara used the name Mystico in his home area, and then the CML used name someone Mystico and this thing car is always claimed that someone stole a name from him but now he's going back to Mexico and stealing a name from somebody else so it's all it's it's a very telenovela situation going on right now yeah we need like a 30 for 30 on this man <laughs> yeah, yeah. break it all down uh, so, uh speaking of things that are very confusing I had some people asking me about this um there are what feels like 10 in Gobernable stables now. Um, we have, obviously, there's LIJ in Japan with uh, Naito, Bushi, Evil, Sonata, Hiromu, and Shingo. And then it was revealed after Final Battle that there is La Faction in Gobernable, which is Ryu Lee, Roosh, and Kenny fucking King. Which, I'm just... that That happened, and I just sat there and shook my head because... They've been trying to get Kenny King over for like 10 years. And now they're like, well, Roosh and Dragon Lee are cool. Maybe this will work. And I'm just (laughs) like, no, no, please. But uh, I guess everybody kind of wants to know, like, how many Ingobernable stables do we have? And, like, what is going on with this? We have at least 
four different ones if we count the New Japan one. Because we have the New Japan one. We have the Ring of Honor one you just mentioned. And I feel like Kenny King is only in the group because his valet is Amy Rose. And Amy Rose speaks Spanish. So they have the Spanish-speaking person who can translate with them. But doesn't really... I don't know how that's going to work long term. It just seems like an odd fit. Um, in AAA, the day after... The day... Was it the day before they did the Ring of Honor stable? Um, Rush formed a Igor Bernal blaze with Rush, L.A. Park, Killer Cross, Conan, and Rush's dad, Lil Beast of the Ring. And so that's, it's, they're also using the name La Faction, Igor Bernable. He used the, he wore the same jersey, both the AAA skit and the Ring of Honor skit, which amused me. But um, I, I think the AAA one is more, they want to get L.A. Park and Rush on the same team before they split them up sometime down the road. So they've just decided to use a popular name, but I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, there's still people running around CML, still using the the iconography, but they're not really pushing the idea of the name. Because Terribly is still there. Terribly occasionally wears Ingo Bernabe gear, but the, he has no teammates since they all left. So it's, all, it's a weird situation. And then... Rush's old, old friend La Mascara quit AAA earlier this year, but when Rush wrestles on the Indies, he still teams with him and his father as another version of Los Ingo Bernables. So there's at least four different ones out there. Rush is the kind of common factor in about three of them, and I think a lot of this is a Rush idea because he's had so much um, success marketing the idea and the gimmick and the 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 clothing and the jerseys that he, like he just wants to run with the thing that's working for him. But I think it does kind of make confusing situation where Killer Cross and Kenny King are sort of in the same stable, but in different countries and different promotions and they're never going to talk about each other. But that's the way it goes, I guess sometimes. It, um, it feels kind of weird because first of all, it's like, I don't think Killer Cross is obviously going to last very long. No. You know, because he, uh, by all accounts, he feels very WWE bound. And I don't know, man. The Ingobernable Christmas party is going to be really weird with Hiromu and Dragon Lee <laughs> hanging out with each other. And like, Yeah. <laughs> I, I almost wonder, I mean, New Japan seems like they've pretty much moved on from paying attention to Ring of Honor storylines. But I, want, I kind of wonder how they're going to handle that when they team at the Dome show. Yeah, I just, uh, it, it's one of those, like, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek, I like to joke about it, but it's like, hey, Felice Navidad, you broke my neck, but we're brothers now, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's very awkward to do that, but um, I think that's what happens when you have different promotions have, doing their different ideas with the same name. So, um, I do wonder if some point, we'll see what novelies they have on become sl- something slightly different, just so... New Japan has a little bit more control of it and keeps can keep it a little bit more unique, but it seems like it's still really over as it is. And I, I don't think it, it hurts the New Japan group by having Kenny King in the Ring of Honor group because no one in New Japan is paying attention to Ring of Honor anyways. Yeah, I was going to say, New, New <laughs> Japan doesn't care about Kenny King. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, well, hopefully that clears up the whole Ingo Bernabe thing a little bit because it is, it's like I kept reading online that I read that that one formed in AAA, and I'm like, okay, how many are we up to now? I'm like, yeah. You know, and then the Ring of Honor one, like, say that happened the next day. I'm like, all right. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. I'm like, that that weekend was so weird because I booked Final Battle for Ring of Honor, and I booked the NWA pay-per-view for them. And it was like they both listened to me and said, Zonka has these good ideas for stables. So we'll do them, but we won't do exactly what he said. Like, why would we want Flamita and, like, Bandito involved when we could have Kenny King? I was like, uh, okay. And then the NWA basically did my uh, Horseman knockoff stable, but instead of James Storm, it was Nick Aldis being the big bad. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll take partial credit on both. Close enough. Yeah, I, I do feel like Ring of Honor has, it's not the, like the biggest Ring of Honor pr- problem, but they have some of these guys who have been around forever in such the same positions that it it feels like you're seeing the same old, same old, even if when they try to put a new spin on it. Like Kenny King is the one that st- sticks out, but I mean, they're still doing stuff with Rut Titus because he had, they had the match at the pay-per-view and it looks like I saw them pr- push some video with him online. So it's like... It, it's like you don't want to be unfair to these guys because I'm sure they've been loyal soldiers for Ring of Honor, but also at some point you need to give other people chances, and it doesn't seem like they're in the big hurry to do that sometimes. 
Yeah, and they're in a they're in a position where you really need some like fresh and interesting names because like that post pay per view taping was actually a lot of fun because they brought in someone we're going to talk about here in a minute, but they brought in like Nicole Savoy, who yeah. and God they definitely need women, so she's really good. They used Halla Wicked from Takara, who I'm a big fan of, and then they brought in Ray Horus, who many remember as Dragon Azteca and uh, Lucha Underground, and he works a bunch of places. So that transitions into my next deal. Um. Flamita is apparently signed with Ring of Honor, and what what is kind of the contractual overview for Flamita going forward? Is he just going to be like Ring of Honor CMLL? And what do you know is, about Ray Horus? Because I heard that they're going to use him going forward, but is he signed, or is he going to kind of work a potpourri of places? What, what do you know? I know that Flamita signed for a one-year deal for Ring of Honor, so he's there through next December. Um as far as Mexico, when Bandi- there was a situation where Bandito was supposed to be on Bandito and Flamita were supposed to be on the big triple AAA show in Monterey, both ended up not working there. Bandito showed up in CML right after, so everyone assumed, okay, Flamita's going there too. Except Flamita had his own situation, and Flamita has bad history with CML that he does not want to return there. But it, 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 the rumor got so strong that AAA assumed that. Flamita was gone and stopped booking him and canceled him off his shows. So I think Flamita wants to go back to AAA and they may just have some time off and he'll be back there early next year. But he's going to be one of those strange situations where you have people working for Ring of Honor, but in Mexico not working for CML and working for other people. Um, that may also be the situation with Ray Horace. I don't know that he's officially signed a contract, but I've been hinted that, that he may be around Ring of Honor a lot in 2020. Um, you've seen with other people, like we saw last year with Tracy Williams and Mark Haskins and PJ Black, where they came in for a match late in the year, and that was enough to get them looked at for Ring of Honor to bring them in for one year. They seem like like generally doing what like NWA Power is doing, where they are giving people a year to see if they have anything with them, and then they will cycle out, cycle in new people, cycle out old people, like how we saw Hal Wicked and Savoy show up this year. And I think Horse, Horse did well in this debut, and I kind of got the impression that he may be around a lot more. All right, yeah, I, I like him a lot, and I think if you, yeah, I have no problem with them bringing in more Lucha guys because I like, I like Flamita, I like Ray Horse, I like Bandito and stuff, so for me, that's a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I was just wondering what the exact deal, because I've I read about some of the stuff with, like, Flamita and, like, the the weird date stuff and how that all worked out. And it's just, again, very confusing in this weird contract season type era we're in, you know? Yeah, um, it's kind of weird for me, because the Flamita thing has been out in Mexico as him being signed for, like, over a month now, and it's weird that Ring of Honor hasn't said anything about it. so it makes me suspicious that maybe Horse 2 has a deal in place, and it just has not, it's been kept a little bit quieter, but it, it, given the bad publicity Ring of Honor has gotten, I would, it surprises me that they're not more, like, they're not boasting about the people they've signed just to try to change a narrative. All right, so sticking with uh, the Luchadors, obviously, um, I, I, I don't know if this is right, I thought I saw Bandito signed with CMLL, yes? Ben, CML said Bandito signed. This, the actual truth was a little bit less than that. Okay. Bandito agreed to work a few dates. Um, it's similar to what we've seen with Phoenix and Pentagon in CML in recent years and um, LA Park, the same situation. It, it's, but it's closer to Phoenix and Penta, where Bandito grew up with main eventing Arena Mexico as a goal. So this is him going back to work some dates so he could live out that goal probably at a much cheaper price than he's working at almost any place else because CML is not paying through the roof to get him. This is more like crushing something off his bucket list, but I don't think he's contractually tied there. And even just getting him in for matches has been tough because they wanted him for two weeks ago, but he had the ring of honor pay-per-view and they wanted him for last week, but he had PWG. So I don't know how much he's going to end up working there, but I think he's going to be in CML from time to time. Okay, um, so what exactly is his... Is he still signed with Ring of Honor, or is he just kind of working there? Uh, what is his ROH New Japan future for 2020 looking like? Okay, so I kind of hinted at this on my blog a few weeks ago, but I, I could be a little more clear than I was there. Um, Bandito had originally signed for a one-year deal with a one-year option for 2020, 
at this point, I do not think he picked up the option. But the other situation was because he was out for a while, they ex- they ex- agreed to extend his deal into 2020. So he's not. I think he's there through. He's not. He's not signed to Ring of Honor right now into WrestleMania weekend, but it's like maybe a month or so before that is when he's actually a free agent. Um, but at the same time, everyone from Ring Around or to anyone else he wants to do with kind of are hoping he makes a decision on what he's going to do for the rest of 2020 already. And as far as I know, at least as of this past week, he has not made any decision. So he, he he's still contractually obligated to Ring of Honor for at least a couple more months. But he does have uh, he has not made a decision past then. All right. So do you still uh, do you see him still working some new Japan like best of super junior like he did last year? I think he would be very interested to do it into doing that. I think um, one of the stories that I don't, I don't think people knew until um, Dragon Lee was posting all his wedding photos is Dragon Lee and Bandito became good friends working on last year's best of super juniors tournament. So I think even besides the Ring of Honor, New Japan connection, wherever there's lots of it. I think Dragon Lee would probably be another guy pushing to get it, bring him back in for next year's Best of Super Juniors. Obviously, that depends on where he's going. I think because he won the PWG title this past weekend, he's probably not going to WWE because, or not planning going to WWE because obviously that wouldn't work in defending that title. But I think... I think if he went to AEW, it would be tough for him to do. And if he went, if he stayed with Ring of Honor, he's probably going to do a tournament. But that all has to be figured out first before they figure out what he's doing in New Japan. Okay, so the, the short of the long, I guess, is he's not really locked in anywhere except he has to finish out the injury time with Ring of Honor, and he's going to work some CMLL. But otherwise, he's largely free to do what he wants. Yeah, I, I think he, he's got a couple more months to work out, and then it, he, to work out that Ring of Honor stuff, and then he can he can make a decision, or he can make a decision not to sign with anyone and just be a free agent and work wherever he wants for dates. Okay, and obviously he's uh, that he's a guy that's going to be a lot of people are going to be interested in signing. I think so. He's, yeah, he's going to have the uh, kind of the the pick of the litter, I guess. Yeah, and and I. Even not signing with how reduced the amount of indie stars there are, if he was a guy that could be booked around to the AEWs and the the Fives and the other places, I think they would be really happy to have another guy with his figure and he could pick his dates and make a lot of money doing it that way if he wanted just to wait it out too. All right, interesting. All right, uh, next up, we, we've talked about Final Battle and Roosh and uh, the Ingo Bernabe everything. Um, Thoughts on Roosh losing the ROH title so quickly to PCO at Final Battle? That really surprised me. The only thing I can figure is that, like, Ring of Runners just really trying to make some news and trying to, by putting PCO as champion, as they thought they would cap- capture some attention. They did capture some attention, but I'm not sure it was really positive attention. So I, I think, I feel like Roosh has to be winning it back on the rematch they're doing in Atlanta, but. Um, I, I think it was just more a Ring of Honor storyline idea rather than anything saying about Russia's status or Ring of Honor. Yeah, I didn't think it was anything with stat. I, I think it was a bad move, like you said, to try to get some attention. And uh, I mean, the PCO story is nice and everything. It's a really cool comeback story, and I, I think it's great. But again, you're a company in a position where you're trying to do undo many months of damage. Uh, dwindling attendance, and I, I don't think a uh, a lifetime achievement cheap pop title change was exactly the best thing to do. Uh, I would be shocked if he doesn't win it back on the 11th when they rematch, because I think he should, but uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting if he doesn't, because I don't, I don't know what exactly the direction is if he doesn't win it back, other than a weird feud with Villain Enterprises. We're yeah, it feels right now. <laughs> it feels like they've been building to something for Marty going to the title, which is obviously weird with Marty's whole own contract situation. And I keep waiting for them to pay it off. So I guess there could be a situation where PCO wins, but then Villain or Villain Enterprises immediately turns on him, and then they do that dispute. But I just don't know that the Marty PCO dynamic would work too well in the ring. It did not work well when they did the number one contenders tournament and they did face in the finals, man. That was no good for yeah. me. So yeah. 
So yeah, I just I I like I said I I, I don't get that title change, but what are you gonna do? Yeah. So they're in a weird place, and uh, I guess to kind of wrap up our little segment here, man. Um, just for anybody that's kind of getting into the lucha stuff, we mentioned like CMLL. They do a lot of YouTube stuff. We have AAA on Twitch, um, which obviously free stuff. As going into twenty twenty, who are kind of the luchadors? I guess just very casual or new fans should be interested in looking at going into this year? Who who are the ones that interest you or you think are ready for a breakout year? I feel like um, in AAA, obviously, Hijo del Vikingo is very exciting, and hopefully he gets a chance to work the U.S. this year, which he did not get pa- this past year. I think he would be an obvious a guy who would blow people away. Who, I think people have seen GIFs but have not seen him in the full matches unless you watch AAA. And his normal opponent, Torres, who seems like he can work work the U.S. more, probably should be working the U.S. more, hopefully, in 2020. Um, he's He did well with the GCW match they did the weekend of All In, that Truro's match that was really cool. Um, if you go for a little deeper cut from AAA, Aramis, who's been working preliminary matches for AAA and was has been on the last few PWG shows, I think you're going to see a lot more of him in the U.S. I think he's a guy who's... Very young, but shown a lot in the early age, and he's a guy who just needs more experience working with different opponents, and I think he'll be a lot better off. Um, with CML, it's it's tougher because they've had so much of a talent drain, but um, I'm hoping that Titan, who's pretty much got Dragon Lee's spot since Dragon Lee has left the promotion, also gets some chances either with Ring of Honor or with whatever New Japan is doing in the U.S., because he's really stepped up his game in the last you know six months, a year, and he's he's been one of the better people in CML lately. Uh, yeah, I like Taurus a lot. He's a he's a dude that you kind of look at and you don't, I guess, like, lack of a better phrase, you don't expect a lot from him. You know, it's like he's kind of a bigger dude. And it's like, okay, he's, he has a wacky, like, Taurus bull mask. And all right, and then he goes out there and, like, I enjoy the shit out of a lot of his work. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah it, I think he's cool. He, he, may, he, I think, because it's such a triple A Mex- literally rare gimmick where it's so over the top that people think it's just going to be a, a, a more of a comedy character, even maybe sometimes. But he's he's so good on his own, and he he makes all the guys he works with a lot better. He's the guy I think would fit in like a GCW as a regular, especially with you know the Blake Christian and flying guys as a good opponent for them to to get the best out of them. All right, uh, I did have one other thing that just came across my mind because you brought up Triple A, and yeah, Triple A is going to be working with MLW, and they've announced some talent for the first stuff they're going to do. But before we get into like Triple A and MLW, what happened with MLW and the crash? Because they seemed to hype that pretty big, and then they did that joint show together that looked like it drew really well, and they brought in some guys here and there, and then it just like went quiet and all of a sudden it's like hey we're working with triple a now it, it's 100 percent conan conan has a long-standing grudge with the crash where he worked with between triple a stints and then they had a bad falling out so when mlw started working with the crash and conan was working mlw uh, conan's goal was to get them to stop working with with mlw and to get his own guys in there so i think that's all that's why the crash thing suddenly and quickly ended and i think that's why you're seeing triple a people in there is just to make sure that the crash doesn't have a a lifeline in the u.s because they've they've had such a talent drain with um people going elsewhere like Ray horse is no longer working with them but was a big star for the crash promotion for a number of years and other people getting pulled into AAA or getting or just getting scooped up by WB or other places that I think Conan's goal is to hope that the crash stops promoting in Tijuana. So if he can take MLW from working with them, that helps his goal. Well, that definitely makes sense. Now that I, I wasn't really thinking about the Conan thing, but yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense and seems like the simplest solution to it. Uh, what are you thinking? Do you like the uh, AAA working with MLW uh, possibilities going forward? It's fine. I, I, just, I have not been overly impressed what they've done with the luchadors in MLW outside Phoenix and Penta, but I think it's nice for those guys to get some extra work. I think the big deciding factor is if MLW is going to invest enough to bringing 
to get visas for guys and bring them in. Because if, like, uh, Hijo del Vikingo makes his M- U.S. debut in MLW, I think they'll be both big for Vikingo and, M- and the promotion. But I'm just not sure if how, how hard. Um, I'm not sure if uh, AAA want. I'm, I'm not sure if MLW really is going to focus on the AAA guys or just more guys to add to the roster to give a different look. I'm not, I guess we'll have to see how that goes, how, how their investment in the AAA guys go. If I'm if I'm triple A man, I it sounds like a dick move, but I don't want Vikingo to get a visa. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I can see him not. I can see them not wanting to have a visa or not wanting to have a visa on any show that's not a triple A show. Because you know MLW does good business. They do good. They do good crowds here in the Chicago area. But I was just thinking the other day about how that New York show, which the triple A New York show was considered a failure. And I think rightfully so, because they were going to run MSG and then they had to move to the theater. But even then they drew 3000 people, which is more than MLW has ever drawn for any show. So I think triple A has the potential to run their own shows and they may want to save their bigger names for the debut for those shows, but I'm not sure if they will ever actually get around to them. All right, fair enough. Yeah, it'll. Excuse me. I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Obviously, a lot of wild dynamics when you're co-promoting and everything. And uh, yeah. I also agree with you that yeah, I don't think MLW has done an overly great job with some of the lucha guys they brought in. They just kind of feel like guys. Pentagon and Phoenix were obviously very different. They had a really good run there, which was also at a really weird time because they were still with Impact and everything, but. Um, I think the weirdest thing I ever saw was when there was the overlap still at the end of Lucha Underground, and like Penta had like a week where he had like four four star, or three four star matches because he was on Lucha Underground and Impact, and then like um, MLW, and I was just like, I was like the wildest shit here. It's like eh, 2019 being 2019, man. You know, it's like, yeah. So. Uh, the, I, I miss those days when those guys were moving around a lot more, but I think it's probably better for them to, to just to have one or two homes and not be all over the place. I think it probably was catching up to them by the end. So uh, I guess since I mentioned in closing, uh, do you do you still lament that we never got any closing to Lucha Underground, man? Because yeah, I, do. <laughs> I, I totally do. I mean, I heard so many ideas pitched about like. The concept of, you know, that maybe we can do a season, but maybe we can just do a weekend of tapings and we can wrap up everything there. Or other people thought maybe we can bring those comic books back and we can wrap it up that way. But I wish we had some sort of ending or even like, you know, Chris to Joseph going on the podcast. This was my idea. Just to somehow convince Joseph to do a podcast with me where he just tell he got off all his ideas for season five. But I'm thinking now that he's in WWE, he's probably going to save any ideas he has for that promotion rather than give them away so we may never know exactly what they were going to do and that's kind of disappointing it is i um i i definitely was very disappointed we never got the 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 closure and the wrap up or a season five for anything and uh i uh i miss dario slash antonio cueto very much Looking back at it, it just amazes me how many cliffhangers they did to end season four with no real sure idea that they were going to come back for season five. I mean, you got that's a bit of bravery in storytelling, but I kind of wish they had more of an idea that season four was going to be it and could have wrapped things up a little bit. If, but that's just the way it turned out, I guess. Yeah, we will. I love the time we got, but I miss it because it was it was fun and wacky and. I still got great matches here and there, and I got. I, I'm a big like B movie slash like Grindhouse movie fan, and I loved this a lot of the shit they did, and it it was so enjoyable. It, it was so en- it was so enjoyable, and they did so much work at making people stars off of that show that yeah. I, I I don't think with all due respect to like MLW and even Ring of Honor and Impact, I think Lucha Underground, at least per hour TV they did, they may have made as many stars or more as those promotions. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, like, I talked about that when I, you know, we did a, like a, a look back Lucha Underground podcast thing. And we were just talking about like, especially you look at the last episode to see where so many of the people went on to, uh, and like Lucha Underground, like a lot of people don't think about it because they forget the early stuff. But like, Season one, man, was like a revelation to so many U.S. fans that didn't watch a lot of Lucha because they were introduced to Pentagon and Phoenix. 
Right. Yeah, the episode three had a, I was thinking about this this week, I don't know why, but Phoenix Penta Drago match, which was like the first time any of those guys had been on US TV, except Drago had been on some Galavision back then. But most people watching Lucha Underground would have known that. And just those guys doing their stuff, Drago doing a dive off the top of one of the elevated places, probably blew away a lot of people just seeing the first time. And it just kind of escalated over the course of that first season, just make putting new people in the spotlight and doing what they could to maximize their potential while they were there. Yeah, so, I mean, I know it wasn't for everybody, but Lucha Underground definitely left a, a good mark. It introduced and built a lot of stars that are featured on TV now, and uh, I will greatly miss it. Me too. I, 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 I even forgive them the Jake Strong stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that the Jake Strong stuff doesn't affect my viewing it's actually funny but so i I can forgive it now (laughs) fair enough all right uh cubs uh tell everybody where they can follow all of your fine work sir you can follow me on twitter at lucha blog and you can see everything i write goes up at lucha blog.com all right again thank you so much for your time sir appreciate you as a friend of the show have a good holiday man okay you too all right uh so all right, welcome back to the closing segment of our show. I am joined now by Steve Cook. Steve, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, Larry Zonka. It's uh, Christmas season. There's football on television. Can't get much better than that. That's right. It's good to have you back, Steve. We're going to talk uh, a few things in wrestling before we get to our kind of main event of our part here. Uh, something we used to do in the old blog talk days when we would do the Christmas time podcast, the airing of the wrestling grievances. It's that time of year, that time of year when we have our festivists. We got to have the airing of grievances. That's right. Um, I got a lot of problems with you people. There you go. <laughs> so uh, first up, before we get into that, I want to I want to get a, a read on some stuff from you. I know you uh, I know you follow a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about here. The first two things kind of on the periphery, on the outside. But uh, January 12th, Impact is running a pay-per-view called Hard to Kill main event. Tessa Blanchard challenging for the world championship against Sammy Callahan. First of all, do you have a problem with Tessa challenging for this championship? And second of all, what do you think about her possibly winning the championship? I have zero problem with Tessa Blanchard challenging for the championship. She's one of the most talented performers on the on the Impact Wrestling roster. One of the most talented performers outside of the uh, you know WWE slash. AEW slash major promotion umbrella. I guess we're still Impact's still not really a major promotion. They do have their own network, but uh, yeah, still kind of on the periphery. But uh, no, no problem with that at all. I know a lot of people don't like the intergender wrestling, and uh, it does get creepy at times. But the way that Impact's presented it in this instance, with what I've seen with Tessa and wrestling guys and whatnot, it's not creepy. It's good old fashioned wrestling. It's uh, Tessa looking like a million bucks most of the time. And, uh, yeah, I just – if you're talking about uh, potential top challengers, I I don't know who else you throw out there. I mean, you want to put Ken Shamrock in there? I mean, we know Ken Shamrock uh, – <laughs> he's, a, he's a talented competitor. At, uh, what is he, 85 years old now, something like that? Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe put him in there, I don't know. But, uh, no, I – had no problem with it, and the, the build from what I've seen with the, this te- the Sammy Tessa thing's been going on for a while, and uh, it definitely deserves a pay per view may event kind of blow off. And uh, what was this? I've forgotten the second part already. My bad. Uh, do you have a problem I, if she wins the championship? No, not at all. Not at all. I would be all about it because um, Impact's in that position where they're they're kind of building things up. They got better TV now. They're Try, they're having better attendance. They're, everything's kind of going in the right direction, but they're still at that level where they can still afford to try things like this. Try something out of the box and see if it works. We have not had a Chikara had a female grand champion, but we have not seen too many female world heavyweight champions. So why not put that title on test and see if it works or not? If it works, great. If it doesn't work, then hey, we learned something. So, yeah, no problem with that at all. All about impact, trying new things. What's wrong if wrestling promotions wanting to try something different? Yeah, um, and the reason I don't have a problem with it is because when intergender wrestling, if you want to label it that, is done right, it's just good wrestling. 
Uh, like I one of I was working on my uh, year end match list stuff, and one of my top matches that made the big list this year, I saw an excellent match with uh, David Starr and Mercedes Martinez from Beyond Wrestling. Mm. Excellent, excellent match. Um, and you'd believe Mercedes against David Starr too, given the heights and stuff. And oh yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And the the thing with it is like intergender wrestling falls into some weird categories. You get the shit that just looks very bad. You get stuff to where the woman feels like she has to prove herself, and then she wants to take a beating, and mm. then it comes off as completely uncomfortable. And that's why people will want to label it that it favors domestic abuse and bullshit like that. Then when you find out that the competitors are like boyfriend and girlfriend, then you just think it's like a kind of weird foreplay or something. It's yeah. kind of gross. And then you get into the next category to where the man they're wrestling has decided they're going to be way too giving. And it almost comes off as unbelievable, especially if they're not close in size like a Mercedes Martinez and David Starr. Yeah. And then you have when it really, really works. And uh, the Starr and Martinez, Martinez match is a great example of that. Uh, one of my favorites was a live match I saw with Mike Quackenbush and Sarah Del Rey. Again, the size difference is negligible because they were very close yeah. in size. But they were also working a very technically based wrestling match. Which also helps. So when it's done right, it's I don't label it as intergender wrestling. I just label it as good wrestling. Um, Tessa is one of the best people in the entire company. She is pretty much, I think it's safe to say, the most over person in the company. She's the person in the company that comes across like a real star. And uh, I've said it before, and you kind of brought it up. Impact is in kind of this weird place. They're growing. They don't really have to worry about upsetting a network now because the Anthem owns the network. That's right. And you can experiment. And I don't see anything wrong with that. What's, I mean, God, maybe she wins. Maybe you actually make a star. Maybe you make some people interested. I don't think it's that big of a turnoff as some people are making it out to be. I think some people want to make it a big deal. Some people want to label it as glorifying domestic abuse and all kind of shit. But it's just, it's it's wrestling. When it's done right, it's done right. You don't see anybody complain when there are like two gay gentlemen or two gay women in the ring that may be a couple and they have a match. Nobody labels that as domestic abuse because nobody even thinks about it in that terms. That's true. Because it's woman versus woman or man versus man. Again, it has to be done right. And their first match at Slammiversary was really, really good. They had a follow-up match that was also very good. And they've played the tone largely right with it. It never comes across as Sammy's abusing a woman. It never comes across that Tessa's constantly overpowering a man to an unbelievable degree. But the other thing is they're decently close in size. And yeah. Tessa has a very athletic build. And it's like when – here's like the other big thing too is like when Tessa throws strikes, she looks like she's hurting people. She knows how to throw a punch. Yeah. yeah. So and like I don't mean that she's sloppy. What I mean is she has a snug, crisp, crisp delivery, and it just works. I, I've heard, uh, I think it was Melter who said in a way she almost works like a Japanese man at times, and like he meant that as a compliment in terms oh, of the intensity and how yeah. crisp her stuff is. So I mean, yeah, I, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, maybe you're taking a chance trying to put the title on her. But you don't know till, till you try. And again, I think Impact's in a, in a position to where I don't think it's going to hurt them even if they get a backlash. Yeah, I'm if not, it doesn't work and it flops, then I don't think it'd be that big a deal. Yeah, And I'm not trying to be an asshole. Like you said, and I agree, attendance has been up. They're on a bigger network. They're still not a high-profile company. But they're on an upswing. But I don't think that this would drastically hurt them. I don't have a problem with it if they make the call. No, and personally, I hope they do. I'd like to see it happen because it'd be something interesting. It'd be something different. It'd be something that Impact be, it could put out there as something new. And I think it would draw some. I think it draw some new eyes, even if it may turn some of their audience off. I think there's kind of may another audience out there that would uh, take a look and be like, "Hey, wait a minute, this is pretty interesting." 
it's something I I didn't see this. I haven't seen anything like this before. This is new kind of pro wrestling to me. So may I, may I will check this out on uh, Access TV. Yeah, but again, you have to do it properly, and you have to have the right woman. And I think in this case, I think Tessa is the right person. You know. Yeah, if it's like uh, throw a name out there, Eva Marie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's Eva Marie, then I'd be kind of I'd be wondering about it a little bit, you know. I mean, even for an example, like Scarlett Bordeaux. Scarlett, uh, you know, she does a lot of intergender matches, and people like them a lot. But uh, I would scoff at the idea of Scarlett Bordeaux as the uh, Impact Wrestling World Heavyweight Champion. Yeah, like someone like Scarlett doing intergender is more of like a side attraction, especially when she's working like a Joey Ryan or a Disco Inferno or shit like that. Yeah, you don't want to see her challenging for the world championship. So, but yeah, I think I think I think you try with Tessa. I don't see the problem with trying. So, and we constantly hear about I wish I wish companies would go outside the box, and well, they are. Yep. And sometimes they go too far outside the box, but that's part of the fun. Yeah. Uh, so next up, uh, something else I know that you follow on the on the kind of outside, Steve Cook. Uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling Wrestle Kingdom is coming up. This year it is a two-day event, January 4th and 5th, and it's being headlined by the Double Gold Dash, which at the end of January 5th, there will be one champion holding the IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships. Steve, what is your feeling on the, uh, what are you thinking about the two-day Wrestle Kingdom experiment and the Double Gold Dash headlining? I like the idea of the, the uh, two-day experiment with Wrestle Kingdom, try to spread it out and see if they can fill two days with it. We've been talking in the past about how that's something that WrestleMania should consider doing instead of having like a 12-hour wrestling show that they've been doing the past couple of years. So I like the uh, I like the idea in general. And since you got a Liger retiring, you got two Liger retirement matches, which is good. I think everybody wants to see that. As far as the double gold dash goes, the uh, well, I won't even say it's a unification of championships because you know how it goes where these titles end up on the same people. And then they get separated at some point. So I doubt that either championships are going away. But I, from what I can tell with New Japan, I, they, got the, they got the IWGP title. They got the Intercontinental title. They got the United States title. Doesn't it kind of feel, it feels like to me that there might be maybe one too many singles titles there? There's, I, also, there's also the Never Open Weight Championship, so yeah. Oh, see, there you that one too. So, uh, and usually they'll put the U.S. title on like a Chris Jericho or John Moxley type that's like never really there. So it kind of feels to me like they they might have an extra championship or two that they really don't need that badly. So I, if they were to get, condense the championships that way. I could not blame them. I think that wouldn't that wouldn't be the worst of ideas. And uh, yeah, and I know that the, let's see, you got Okada involved, you got uh, you got Ibushi, you got Jay White, and you got uh, Naito, right? Yep. So I mean, you're you're gonna get uh, probably four good matches out of that. And uh, although I do, I do kind of wonder why they're having the third place match. I think the third place match is that's basically going to kind of be almost like a default contenders match for one of like the shows. Like a number one contender? Yeah. yeah, one of the follow-up shows to Wrestle Kingdom. So Okay, well, so it kind of makes sense in that regard. So you're going to get, uh, you'll get four good matches out of it. So I see no, I, I have no issue with it. Yeah, uh, I, I think the two-day Wrestle Kingdom, it works especially great this year because fourth and fifth are on a Saturday and Sunday. And it's it's a good thing to experiment. They've... People have been um, kind of mixed reaction because they've split some of the traditional events into two or three shows now during the year and stuff. But the thing is, overall, attendance was up again this year. Okay. So they did not lose out on attendance. And I think you have to experiment with this. You, you do the two-day Wrestle Kingdom thing. You have, as you said, you have the Liger Retirements. We have Double Gold Dash. We have a lot of championships. You have a Rev Pro Championship being defended as well with Zack Sabre Jr. Another singles title. See, there you go. <laughs> That's not so much a New Japan canon title. It's just they, they will use it on the big shows, and especially with it. They do uh, kind of hype him as a British heavyweight champion, right? Yeah, he is. It, yeah. It's, a, it's a Rev Pro British heavyweight championship. Yeah. So, um, But, yeah, so, I mean, you have plenty of stuff to fill out the cards. You have a loaded roster to fill out these cards. Where is the ROH champion on the show, by the way? Uh, yeah, yeah, not not there. No, not there, huh? Yeah. How about that? Yeah, funny how that works out. Hmm. 
So, but yeah, you have plenty of stuff to load up these shows. I have no problem with them trying it. I think it's good. And again, I've I've said this before. If this works and they sell well over 30,000 both nights, do not be surprised if WrestleMania, they experiment in coming years with splitting that show. Especially when you have NXT as a main roster property now. Yeah. You, you could just drop TakeOver and do two days of WrestleMania. Are they still doing TakeOver on WrestleMania weekend this year? Is that yeah. still happening? Yep. Okay. I mean, what, is it like, what are they doing, Saturday or... Yeah, Hall of Fame is Thursday, SmackDown Friday, TakeOver Saturday, WrestleMania Sunday. Oh, my God. And they're going to do SmackDowns. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about all that. Yeah, I mean, because like I, I thought they're going to have to they're gonna have to take over in Portland, which can be completely separate from everything else, I think. And yeah. uh, so I kind of thought they were phasing out the whole TakeOver picking back on, back in on the main pay-per-views thing. No, they're ex- they're not. they're going to experiment because the uh, Takeover Twenty Five did really well on its own, and um, so they're going to experiment a little more with doing the um, t- separating the Takeovers a bit, and then doing a little more like with the uh, Rumble Weekend with the Worlds Collide show. They're going to do some more of that stuff, I think. So, kind of, kind of, going to kind of mix up and change the recipe a little bit, which I have no problem with. I get you. So. Well, let's ask you, being uh, being the expert, who who's going to exit uh, Wrestle Kingdom with all the, with all the gold? You want me to give away my preview already? <laughs> I don't know if I. Could... I've heard some speculation. I, I hear people saying it might. I've heard people saying they might finally put Naito over, but then some people say it's actually Ibushi's time. A lot of people think it's going to end up being Okada and Naito on night two, and the Naito is finally going to get his big win. All I'm going to say is I do not subscribe to that theory. Okay. Because I'm do- we're doing a preview next week. They had their weekend. chance on that, man. I'm telling you, they had their chance tonight. They had that chance there, and they didn't do it. Well, that, and I know people don't like to believe it. They're like, whoa, he's the same age as Ibushi. Yeah, but Naida's like a fucking physical shell of himself. He's like early 2010s TNA Kurt Angle at this point. I got to tell you, I mean, I've seen some Naito stuff, and I I am not as impressed with him as a lot of people are. I'm sorry. I just, I don't really see it myself. Well, I mean, here's I know thing. he does the, he does the pose. He, he's got the pose going. I know that. Well, here's the thing. Garden variety Naito t-shirt matches are never going to impress anybody. Mm. They are yeah. lazy. He takes it easy because he's so banged up. I was joking with Ian Hamilton from backbodydrop.com on the, this morning when we were watching the show, we were talking on DM and. Naito comes out and he always has his knees wrapped up real heavy and like he had like his entire left leg wrapped up today and I'm like <laughs> wow. I'm like Jesus Christ this dude's gonna be a mummy by January 5th man. he was rocking the Ahmed Johnson knee braces is what you're saying uh no it's just like he was like ace wrapped <laughs> up from like ankle to crotch on his left leg man it's oh, like yeah that's that's not Jesus good. Christ so yeah it's uh yeah Jeremy and I are gonna be doing a full preview um uh, let me pull up a calendar here, and I'll tell you a date. It's going to be before the show's off. Uh, I think we're to record on the 29th and do our full two day preview of Wrestle Kingdom there. So, um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, my man is hurting. His neck is fucked. You can tell. Like he's wearing the T-shirt mostly because he doesn't work out his upper body because he can't because mm-hmm. of his neck issues. So you're saying that putting him over is probably not going to happen. So- what you're saying. I think it would be a bad idea. I know everybody's like, oh, well, they missed a chance. They need to make up for it. No. They don't, you don't need to make up for it. No. ROH fell in the trap of making up for it, and they end up with a bunch of unover champions. Yeah. So, <laughs> But that's another issue for another time. And uh, and we've heard nothing about uh, Access TV airing Wrestle Kingdom either, I, I assume. Uh, no, because that night they're running a best of impact. Ugh. Yeah, not a fan of that. Yeah, even though the uh, New Japan deal lasts through 2020, um, it's not looking good for the future there. I think they're being phased out. Mm. Well, that's a shame. Yeah. All right, so one uh, one request I had, I get some email requests for topics every once in a while, Steve, before we get to the grievances. I like ha- emails. Had that's an cool. email asking me, why does Jerry Lawler still have a job? Is there some kind of blind loyalty <laughs> Vince McMahon has to him? I think it's a good question. That's a good talking point. And I think that there are a few reasons Jerry Lawler's still around. Yeah. 
And I will start with this, and I will let you uh, elaborate and respond. Sure. First of all, we're in an era where they're throwing money and re-signing everybody because Vince doesn't want to allow anyone perceived as important to leave and go to anywhere, be it AEW, Impact, whatever. They made that mistake once. Yes. And the fact is that (laughs) while Jerry Lawler, I don't find him to be good at his job, and while Jim Ross I could get rid of most weeks, Mm -hmm. let's be real – Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, for most people, were the soundtrack of the Attitude Era. Yep. And while a commentary team is certainly not going to win a war and is not going to make a difference to ratings, I think that Vince would just rather overpay Jerry Lawler to stay around so that he doesn't have have to let anybody else have him. Your thoughts? And I think that's great news for all elite wrestling. Personally, because yeah. I think the the last thing we need on All Elite Wrestling Dynamite every Wednesday night is Jr. and the King. We just Fuck we don't need that. No. I, oh God, that would be, you know, honestly, they should let him have Jerry Lawler. Why? Not? That's what I would do. But uh, yeah, a little sabotage. There you go. A little sabotage. That's right. But uh, no, I mean, uh, as far as why Lawler still has a job, I do think that uh, Vince does have a bit, of, a bit of a blind spot when it comes to Lawler. Uh, you might, I mean, hell, Vince and Lawler were, were, were one of uh, Raw's longest running commentary teams together. It was right after when Macho Man pieced out and went to WCW that uh, Lawler took over and joined Vince on Monday night, and they worked together for a few years there. And, uh, well, they became friendly during that time. I think Vince has a lot of respect for Jerry and for what Jerry did back in the day with the, uh, with the Memphis territory, where he was the promoter slash booker slash wrestler slash all of that. You might even re- you might remember Larry back uh, 1993, I think it was, where Vince came in and kind of had the uh, first uh, kind of first glimpses of the evil Mr. McMahon character. If yeah. you remember that, you're running over my talking points, but that's all right. <laughs> I am running over your talking points. That's right. That's okay. No, but uh... so, but there's some history there with Vince that with Vince and Jerry, definitely. I'm, you know, and Vince has a lot of respect for the guy, and even uh, back. Uh, 2001, when uh, Jerry left the company, when they fired his then wife, I think Vince uh, got some respect from for that too, because we know we know how Vince is in some of these situations where, you know, if you stick if you stand up for yourself, he actually respects you, and if you try to kind of uh, you know back down and let people walk all over you, that uh, Vince doesn't like that. So King stuck up for himself there, and I think that just it, I think it just all adds up to Vince having a lot of respect for Jerry Lawler. Yeah, um, I agree. And to to go on to kind of something you brought up, my next point was, um, I the thing a lot of people forget is Jerry Lawler was the one that allowed Vince McMahon to live out his dream in the USW <laughs> USWA because Vince wanted to be a wrestler. Yep. And Vince Senior wanted no part of that for him. He did not even want him involved in the wrestling business at the beginning. Vince always dreamed of being a bad guy wrestler and he got to go to USW, USWA and this was prior to evil Mr. McMahon appearing on WWE TV. That is when that character had its initial genesis on those USW, USWA shows. So I think Vince kind of has a like kind of repaying a debt because Jerry allowed him to do something his father never wanted him to do. And it was a dream for Vince, and I think that that was important to him on some level. And I think uh, that stuff is probably still up on YouTube. You can kind of search it, like Vince McMahon USWA or something. Yeah, I remember at one point, like all that stuff is up on YouTube, and it's really interesting stuff. You know, the the early prototype of Mr. McMahon. Exactly, and seriously, like Steve said, if you go to YouTube, see if you can find it. It's very much worth a watch. It's very fascinating, especially if you watched the Attitude Era and and Mr. McMahon and all that stuff to see its early beginnings. You can see a lot of what it became came from that USWA run. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely good stuff. Definitely check that out. And uh, like we said, there's just a level of respect there between Vince and between the King. And that's why, that's why Jerry Lawler probably gets a longer leash than a lot of people do. That's why Jerry Lawler doesn't have to prepare for shows. That's why Jerry Lawler doesn't have to worry about Vince yelling in his ear. Like a lot of the announcers do. Exactly. Next point is, I think it, to some degree, I think Vince was a big fan of Lawler. I think like, the Lawler Kaufman stuff and a lot of the entertainment stuff, like bringing in Adam West and all the wacky shit. You know Vince wishes they had done Andy Kaufman gimmick. He oh, wishes yeah. that 
had gone had done that. But I think Vince was a big fan of his. And that also translates into this talking point that Lawler was one of the only guys Vince didn't try to crush. He signed him, and he had enough respect for Lawler that he allowed him to still work Memphis because he knew Jerry was never coming after him. He knew Memphis was small. He knew Jerry just wanted to be the king of Memphis. But he respected and liked him enough, I think, that he wanted to bring him in and have him work for him. But he was willing to make um, accommodations for Lawler that he would make for nobody else. No, he would he would not make this accommodation for a lot of guys that came in. Because generally during, I mean, that was the time when he was just, he would buy stuff out and crush the territory and absorb everything, and that was it. There was The only no, other guy I can think of that even had the kind of leeway was back in the day when Roddy Piper would still work for Don, for Don Owen in Portland. And he would not work the Carolina shows. That's the only other guy I can think of that had that kind of leeway. Yeah, and again, that's because Portland was such a small thing, and that's because it meant a lot to Piper, and Piper made Vince a fuck ton of money. Yeah. So I think that's another point people really have to consider. I think it's part of that loyalty thing. And then the last one, and it should be really obvious, I mean... Let's be blunt, Jerry Lawler, even if it was for a couple minutes, died on WWE TV. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. That's a good point. I almost forgot about that one. Yeah, I mean, that could that could lead to some legal situations. You just never know. Although, he's he's freaking lucky he almost died on WWE TV and not like in a hotel room or something. Or on a fucking indie show with like no EMTs. Well, an indie TV. show, yeah. Fortunately, he almost died right in front of some doctors. So, it worked out pretty well for him. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that, like, that happened and, like, you know, Vince obviously took care of him, doesn't, won't allow him to do angles on TV anymore. I mean, Which pisses him off still. Yeah, I know. He, he hates the fact he can't wrestle on TV still. I know it does. And don't get me wrong. I love, I used to love the occasional King appearance in Memphis and stuff, dropping the fist on to Jay Brown and, yeah. you know, just doing some fun stuff. But, yeah, I mean, obviously after that incident, you can't let the guy work on TV. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing. Jerry still does indie dates. He does. God bless he, him. He's, he's still working on his indies. He's still he, looking good. He still drops the fist. He throws an occasional drop kick. He throws a pile driver. Everybody's happy. Yeah. I mean, look at it this way. The King still actually takes a bump on his finish, unlike the Honky Tonk Man. <laughs> Have you fucking seen the Honky Tonk Man doing the shake, rattle, and roll on an indie show? Not in the last 10 years, no. Oh, no, he does. <laughs> He does it, but what he does oh, is God. he grabs is he still, the guy. Is he, still hang on. he grabs the guy, he shakes him a couple times, and then he starts to swing and just lets the guy go and has him take a bump for him. He doesn't even take the bump. Oh God. That's brutal. So I mean, yeah. He ain't so, no rock and roll express, I'll tell I'll tell you that. God damn right he isn't. <laughs> so um the only thing that I hate about Jerry Lawler being on uh under WWE contract is no lie. I would mark for like Jerry Lawler popping up on NWA power and working like the question mark. Uh, <laughs> I want Jerry Lawler to have the rights to the Memphis library and have like a whole streaming service of that. There you go. Is what I would like. <laughs> but I mean, I paid nine 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 a month for that. Why not? There you go. But I think honestly, if you look at it, I think those are some of the big reasons why Vince keeps him around and is probably willing to overpay and just, you know, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, it's I don't think it's like like a big conspiracy type thing. I I just think no. that, like, he doesn't want to let people go. He wants to keep the people that he's invested years and money into around. And he has that loyalty to him for a few reasons. Yeah, and I, I just don't think, well, I don't think he's that bad. I'm sorry. There's a lot worse out there. He's all right sometimes, but there are times where I just kind of shake my head and I'm like, I'm like, really, dude? It's like, to me, he feels kind of dated sometimes, but yeah, I, mean, I mean, I don't hate it. I mean, honestly, like I said, there are way worse people out there. Yeah, so, one of them's on Friday night, you know? I don't know. Two of them are on fi- Friday night. Two of them are on Friday night. night. That's right. <laughs> Hell, three of them are on Friday night. She doesn't announce anymore. So, it's <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, that's the that's the Jerry Lawler portion. Steve, anything else you want to add to that? 
Oh, not really, except, uh, you know, God bless the king, is all I can say. I, I, I still like the guy. I know a lot of people don't for whatever reason. And, you know, there's some questionable stuff out there. You can just ask Doug Gilbert about all that. But uh, he's all right in my book. Yeah, the, the the worst thing that happened, though, to King was Samoa Joe popping up on Raw commentary. Because Joe is just way too good. Well, he, he won't have to worry about that too much longer, I don't think. Shh. Yeah, I know. Steve. <laughs> Dio Madden's coming back, right? Yeah, Dio Madden, who died at the hands of Brock Lesnar. <laughs> I mean, what was Paul thinking on that one, honestly? I I don't know. What and on was... and I don't know about I don't know if you have a really hot take on Vic or not. I don't really have a hot take on Vic except I remember nothing he ever says. Vic's fine. I don't have a problem with him. He doesn't annoy me like Michael Cole does cuz he's not out there yelling, "It's boss time." <laughs> or "It's the big dog." And they had to have Roman and Sasha on that show just so he could do that. Yeah, pretty much. All right, so uh, we're done talking Jerry Lawler. We're done talking that. Steve Cook, it is time for the airing of the 2019 Wrestling Grievances. All right. Something you look forward to every year. I yes. will allow you to start with your first grievance. Ah, yes. Um, well, let me lead off. While we're talking about commentators and commentary and all that stuff, we're talking about announcers. We're talking about this sort of thing. And honestly, I've just had enough of Jim Ross and commentary. I just have. I'm sorry. I know JR is a living legend. I know he's Boomer Sooner. He was the voice of the Attitude Era. He was the voice of Mid South Wrestling, UWF, and Dice W, and Ric Flair versus Ricky Steamboat, and all that stuff. But in 2019, hence to 2020, I have just had enough of grumpy old Jim Ross sitting there behind a desk on AW, just whining bitching and moaning about everything and then whining bitching and moaning about people whining bitching and moaning about him that's what he does now i mean even now uh, like the last few weeks anytime he says something, like well i'm sorry blah, blah, blah. it's just it's awful i'm sorry it's just i have no time for this right now and i don't know it's just I don't understand why somebody hasn't tried to talk to him about it. Like, how come nobody in AEW with any kind of authority has the balls to stand up to this guy and be like, can you at least sound like you're kind of happy to be here? My God. Yeah, you know, maybe do your job, put over the show. Something? I mean, just do something. You Say you just crap on everything for two hours and nobody, as far as I can tell, nobody's complained about it, I guess, to him. Nobody, uh, I guess nobody with the authority to do so has the has the guts to do anything about it. It's just, it's just, it's bad. No, I completely, I, I completely He's dropping Chris Statlander's weight on count. Like, what are you doing, man? What's going on here? Yeah, he, he, a bunch of little shit that annoys me with him. I totally agree. Um, the other thing, too, is apparently you're not allowed to comment on Jim Ross because you're being mean, you're diminishing his <laughs> legacy, and blah, blah, blah. He, he's, he's diminishing his legacy. Come that, on now. Well, First of all, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm criticizing his current work. I say nothing about his past work, which I have a large love for and a large amount of respect for. Sure. And there were, was a time and point that I said numerous times that nobody calls a big match like Jim Ross does. And that's because at the time it was true. That's not the case today. There are times where he shines through, like he shined through on that Dusty and Cody match. You can tell when he cares about something. See, that's, a, that's yeah. the thing. You can tell when he's interested, when he's happy to be there, when he cares about something. So uh, somebody needs to tell him to act like that all the damn time. Exactly. So I totally agree on Jim Ross. And uh, another point I'll throw out there is that people whine and complain and bitch about uh, the other commentary on Wednesday night, Mauro Ronaldo. They complain, oh, he's 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 digging too deep into the pop culture references. Oh, he's just he's yelling and screaming about everything. He just sounds too excited. I would take that over Jim Ross. I'm sorry. I will take a commentator that is. Listen, I know Morrow is turned up to eleven at all fucking times. Yeah, I get it, and I get why that turns some people off. But I will take a guy that is overexcited, overselling, and completely passionate about the product. Over 99% of the other announcers out there today. Damn right. I'm with you on that. Because at least, I mean, I get why it does bother people, Steve. But the thing is, 
At least the man is passionate about what he's doing. He and, cares. He gives a shit. Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to put everything over as much as he can. God but bless him. I agree with your number one. My number one, Steve Cook, is, is something that is probably never fucking going away, but that annoys me all the fucking time. The WWE show opening promo segment. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Please have some originality. Why do you think people get so excited the fact that AEW has found like 11 different ways to open their show on Wednesday nights? Yeah. Because everybody's sick of the same fucking show opening every week. It's not that hard. We've said it for years. Start with people in the ring. Start with a match like three seconds into it. Start with a brawl backstage. Just do something fucking different. Because it becomes monotonous. It becomes impossible to care. Nobody can cut a good promo for 20 minutes anymore. Because nobody ever could cut a promo for 20 minutes that was good. Look at all the classic promos that are awesome from Flair and Dusty and guys like that. They were two and a half to five minutes at the fucking most. You can do two of them in 20 minutes. That's right. (laughs) Hard Times is like a four minute fucking promo. It's one of the most iconic goddamn pieces of business in the world. They're still naming shows after it for God's sakes. So, right. I am sick of the show opening fucking promo. Ah, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And who, who they, they have, you know, you got fucking Seth Rollins out there doing them now, for God's sakes. You got, uh, what was it, last night you had Daniel Bryan cutting into the Miz into fucking King Corbin. Oh, boy, right? Yeah. Excitement. <laughs> Excitement. Personified. Like, yeah, I'm... I'm with you on that. We got to get to, we got to get rid of these show opening promos. They're just not great. Not a good piece of business. And I'm just going to keep on the WWE bandwagon right now. You know, the main thing that's been bothering me about WWE for the past uh, several months or so, it seems like it's really picked up since Paul Heyman took over Raw. Once Paul Heyman became the executive director of Monday Night Raw or whatever he does there. Why are there so many fucking cuck storylines now? It's Why is there man. week after week of Rusev and Lana and Bobby Lashley and this whole thing that just will not fucking end? And why was there this stuff with Maria and Mike Kanellis? And eventually it ended because I think Mike Kanellis just went home. <laughs> but we got, uh, we still got Rusev and Lashley and Lana and blah, 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 blah. And I guess it gets YouTube uh, video. It gets YouTube views from people who type in cuck into the search engine. That's what they get, and that's what they watch, I guess. I don't know. It's just ridiculous. I just am not a fan of the whole situation, and it needs to go far, far away. And uh, apparently, I mean, Rusev seems to like it, so I'm not sure what that says about Rusev. Because you know what happened? I guarantee you he got pissed off and went and talked to Vince. (laughs) <laughs> and he went in there, and he went in there all pissed off, and then we know the story, man. Vince yeah. did the fucking Jedi mind trick. Oh, yeah. And Rusev, and Rusev walked out. out with- Rusev walked out and went, by God, that's good shit, pal. He walked out with Vince's cock in his mouth is what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, God, it's awful. I awful. Second and this. I know it gets YouTube views. Okay. I mean, Who whatever. Gives maybe, a fuck? I mean, maybe Rusev gets pops. I don't know, but... Do you really think that guy's going to be a fucking main eventer again? Come on. It makes me not care about the guy at all, and I like him a lot. We do. I mean, we, I mean, then Lana had potential once upon a time. But then Lana got to do more stuff. <laughs> which involves talking all the time. Yeah, which is not really her strong points. And uh, I don't know what to say about uh, and Lashley. What the, uh, Remember when Lashley went to Impact Wrestling, and all of a sudden people were like, oh, my God, Bobby Lashley is really good. Then he went back to Dewey, and, well, nobody's saying he's really good now. They, I still contend that they fucking blew it with Lashley. Like you could have brought him in, built him up for six months as a fucking murderer, hyping his MMA background, could have done a big match with Brock that probably would have got a little bit of interest and been fun and fresh. Oh, my God, a fresh fucking match. But why do that? And I don't know what Heyman's infatuation is with, the, with this cuck stuff. I don't know. I don't know what's up. I think it says more about the people writing the show. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. All right. My next one, Steve Cook. Scripted promos that don't sound like real people talking. (laughs) Jesus Christ. I watch WWE TV 
And these fuckers go out there with their scripted promos and their memorized lines. And they do not talk like any person alive that I know. It makes them completely unrelatable. It makes me impossible to care about them. Like, I saw, I've seen, like, specials on the network with, like, Baron Corbin. And dude seems like a really fucking interested guy and really well-spoken. I have seen there's I have seen those things and yes he did come off like a somewhat interesting person. And then he goes out there and he's he's making fun of the big dog and talking about chihuahua barking <laughs> and dog food and shorty gable 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 ha 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 you're short shorty gable. Mm-hmm. Jesus fucking Christ. End it. <laughs> Just give these fuckers bullet points and let them put it in their own words so they sound like real people so I maybe have a chance to actually get invested in them and actually care about them on an emotional level at some point. Or at least not have them sound like the same goddamn fake person. Have them sound like some different fake people. Why not? Horrible. They all sound like the same person who doesn't exist. Can't fucking deal with it. Who's not real. I got you. And you mentioned Chad Gable. Or Shorty Gable, Shorty Gable, Shorty Gable. Which uh, brings me to another one of my grievances. This guy, Chad Gable, he was an Olympic he was an Olympic wrestler, right? Yes, sir. The man has Olympic credentials. He uh, He's a damn good worker in that ring. I have seen this man do incredible things great in NXT. Yeah, great, great physique. Absolutely. Looks like, a, looks like he could be a star. The problem is he's in WWE. And the problem is he's on the main roster. And the problem is that uh, we decided the only thing that matters about Chad Gable is that he's short. It's not a Shorty G. And, uh, you know, Shorty G, Shorty G, Shorty G, Chad Gable, blah, blah. No. Then now we were at the point where nobody in their right mind could possibly care about this guy. Because we have been told time and time again not to care about this guy. If, if Chad Gable was in any other promotion, if he was in AEW, if he was in New Japan, if he was in uh, NWA, if he was in, even if he's in freaking Ring of Honor or Impact or whatever, he could go anywhere else and they would treat him a lot better. They would probably treat the guy like a star. They'd probably book him properly or at least more properly than these assholes are. So one of the main things that pisses me off these days that I have agreements with is the fact that Chad Gable should be a fucking star in this business. Instead, he's a fucking joke. Yeah. Telling you, you can go anywhere else. Can you imagine? I mean, put Gable in AEW, have him wrestle, have him wrestle Pac, have him wrestle Omega. I think that worked pretty good, right? You can put him a lot of places, dude. And like you said, he'd he'd pretty much be outside of pay. He'd probably be better off and happier. <laughs> Because, I mean, honestly, you know, WWE's not... I mean, they're the ones paying the big money. I mean, yeah. Christ, you're paying J. Brones, like, Jinder and Mojo 500 grand <laughs> a year, for fuck's sake. Oh, my gosh. My next, Crazy, huh? my next grievance, Steve Cook, is the Lights Out gimmick. <laughs> okay. it, it, it's a combination yeah. of everybody, but AEW went really over the top. I mean... When you're using the fucking lights out gimmick for the ten guys entrance for awesome calm <sighs> appearing for the dark yeah. order, I mean, and then you're using it for random other shit, and then anytime anybody else does the lights out thing, I just fucking groan anymore. Yeah, overused yeah. cliche trope at this point. They drove that into the fucking ground. They really did. And you know, back in the day, you know when is when ECW did and when, when it was Sabu, it meant something. When the lights went out, you knew it was fucking Sabu. And it was going to be good. And hell, you know, WDF had the lights out for the Undertaker. Undertaker is a pretty big deal, right? So that, that worked pretty well. But now, yeah, it's lights out for freaking Sean Spears. And it's lights out for this guy and for that guy. And they also ran the lights out match gimmick to the ground, too. Well, yeah, I, I've ran that. Because they decided they had to have these matches, but they didn't want them to reflect negatively on the win-loss record. So yeah. we'll just have a bunch of lights out matches. And so now they can't do lights out matches anymore because nobody cares. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Um, so I don't have a really good uh, segue into my next one that I want to go off on about. But uh, so I was watching NXT this past week and very good show, by the way. Love. One of the first weeks I would unequivocally say it was a lot better than AEW. But, man, they loaded that show. I mean, you had Rhea Ripley win title. You had the Amical Finn Balor match. So, yeah, really damn good show. 
But uh, one thing I noticed, I was watching the Io Shirai and uh, Santana Garrett match, and Io's doing her entrance and whatnot, and she's over in the corner. I, I guess somebody yells something at her, and uh, Io replies with, I'm Japanese, bitch. Yes, yeah, some asshole yelled at her, go back to China. Yes, which apparently is a thing that happens a lot down in the NXT country. Down in Florida, I guess. I mean, it's a big thing on the Florida loop that uh, apparently there are a lot of racist wrestling fans out there who are willing to yell this kind of nonsense at, at performers. And I wish we were really past this. And I know I'm, uh, and I, and like you, uh, you were talking about how some things would never go away. This is one of those things that won't go away because right now, wherever you go in the road, uh, we have politicians that are stoking the, flaming the fire here, encouraging this kind of behavior from people to uh, make them vote their way and whatever. You know, they're they're encouraging this type of racist activity, and it's not alien to just wrestling. If you go, I mean, European soccer is full of this type of behavior of. Uh, you know, monkey chants and the people throwing things and then all this just stuff that should have been left back in the 1800s, for God's sakes. We're still dealing with it now. It's fucking ridiculous. And if you're one of these people, these shows that decides, huh, I'm going to yell, go back to China at this Asian wrestler, then just stop attending shows. Uh, just stop attending uh, shows. One Don't step watch better, wrestling. Uh, stop Don't read my columns. Go the fuck away. Stop breathing. Stop, yeah, stop being reading. alive. Stop being an asshole. I mean, Stop being racist. Jesus fucking yes. Christ. It's fucking pathetic. Yeah, it's... it's. I hear stuff all the time from the Coconut Loop shows, and it's so depressing. I feel really bad for the NXT talent that have to work. And Obviously, it's not all the fans. But the no. fact that any of them have to deal with any of this bullshit... And apparently, is, the security doesn't do enough to get rid of these people either. Yeah, it's it's sad, and it's... Shit that we shouldn't be talking about in 2019, and unfortunately, we're probably still going to talk about in 2020, Steve. Oh, we'll definitely be talking about 2020 for sure, but uh, it just it pisses me off. And, uh, you know, and I'll say it. I mean, if if and if you're the type of person who does this, you should not. Don't watch wrestling. Don't read my fucking columns. I don't care. I don't want you around in life, you know? Yeah, don't need your click that bad. No, I don't need the clicks that bad. I mean, you you people who aren't racist, go ahead and click away. But, you know, those, those people can go away. Jesus Christ. Terrible. My next, Pissed me off. <laughs> my next one is alleged fans, because if you're doing this, you're not a fan. Alleged wrestling fans that mock smaller companies that s- sell out small venues as not real accomplishments. Mm. This has annoyed me this year. Impact has worked really hard to turn around, and... Some of their pay-per-view shows, they were running smaller venues, 700 to 1,000 or 1,100 seats or whatever, and they were selling them out. Oh, what's the big fucking deal? It's 1,000 people. Well, when you were having trouble selling tickets for years and you have such a bad stigma, the fact that you've turned it around to the to the point that you're getting 1,000 paid fans is a very good thing. They sold more than that in Chicago. They did about 1,300, I think. And they're doing better. These are good things. You should be happy for this company. Okay? People mocking the NWA for selling out hard times. Well, it's what? 250 or 300 seats. What's the big fucking deal? The big fucking deal is the fact that the NWA is even alive in 2019. And that people are actually interested in it. And they're making people pay. They're not just selling $5 tickets. They're selling VIP packages. They're also selling out two days of TV tapings afterwards. It's small steps. The NWA is not going to be AEW and sell out a 10,000 seat fucking arena right now. But they have to start somewhere. The studio setting is perfect for them. They're selling the studio setting out. You don't have to treat it like it's the second fucking coming of Christ... But maybe give them a little bit of credit for selling the tickets. Because I'll tell you what, not everybody has had a hard or an easy time selling tickets in 2019. I'm looking at you, Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. Are they selling any tickets? <laughs> it's a better question there, but yeah. They are, but they had a drastic decrease in attendance this year. Absolutely, they did. You know, that Madison Square Garden show really helped them out for their overall 2019 figures. Other than that, they'd be... You take oh, the Madison older. Square Garden figures out, and they're down something like 75%. God. <laughs> brutal. Brutal. But uh, I think a lot of this goes back to back when WWE had that stomping ground show. Remember that? 
I think it was in, what is it, Oregon or whatever? Uh, Washington, I think. Wash, it's up in Washington. They had the Stomping Grounds show. Something like that. And there were some pictures of the crowd that for the Stomping Grounds pay-per-view that we all agree that Stomping Grounds is a terrible name, a terrible show. Uh, I think, the, was that the one with the main event with uh, Rollins and Corbin? Was uh, I think that was one of the Evans as a referee, I think. But that whatever, might be, it's, uh... it's fucking terrible. <laughs> Nobody was interested in watching that show. And there were pictures of the crowd from that show, and it didn't look good. Like, I think the curtain was drawn really tight. There wasn't a whole lot of fans on the hard camera side. And once people saw these pictures and started making fun of them, WWE fans got really pissed off. They were like, how dare you make fun of our company for drawing a bad crowd for to a pay-per-view? So now they're going to jump all over AEW anytime they have an empty seat at Dynamite taping. They're going to jump all over NWA for only run 250 seat venues. They're going to jump all over Impact for, you know, run 1,000 seat venues or whatever. They're just going to jump all over everybody now because they got their feelings hurt back when back at stopping grounds. Yeah. I, I, I just, I don't get all this negativity. It's like, it's such a vicious cycle. You have a fan, you have fans that go... God, I wish we had viable competition to WWE on a national level and somebody had an awesome cable TV deal. AEW sells a bunch of pay-per-views without TV. They sell a bunch of tickets without TV. They get a big cable TV deal and get on TV. Now it's, fuck AEW, I hope this company dies. And then, <laughs> and then if they die, what's it going to be, Steve? Man, I <laughs> wish we had a viable alternative with a great cable TV deal to fight WWE from their monopoly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like you should be, people should be happy that Impact's improving. Yep. People should be happy that the NWA is actually giving us a cool alternative to everything else. You know, we should be happy that AEW's around that has a cable deal. It's like, this is such a great era, and I don't understand why people are like, just bitching to bitch, man. This is like, this is such a great era, and then you add all the streaming services on top of that. You can watch a- a- All Japan at the drop of a hat. New Japan. You can watch Dragon Gate. You can watch Progress. You can watch so much shit now, man. Yep. I mean, you Anything should be you thrilled. Want. You should be. But we're not because, well, I don't know why we're not. Well, no, no, no. We are. <laughs> we're, we're doing pretty good. I'm pretty happy with the, I'm pretty happy with things, although we are, uh, we're doing our grievances right now. It should be pointed out that this kind of a once-year thing we do, where we get all we get all the bitching out in the open, and we feel pretty good afterwards. All in all, we're pretty positive guys when it comes to the current state of the wrestling business. We I think. are. I think we're pretty positive. But uh, you know what? I'm gonna hop on the AW thing one one more time here. Go ahead. Since we we mentioned all elite wrestling, and uh, I meant uh, even in that column I posted this week. I mentioned I like a lot of what AEW's been doing on Dynamite Show. I like a lot of what... The, I know not all of it has worked perfectly. I know there's been some uh, rough patches in the matches and whatnot. And I know the women's division could be a little bit better. But all in all, I enjoy the product. I like watching it every Wednesday night. It's a good time to me. But the one thing that kind of bothers me... And I'm not saying that the company's going to get out of business. I'm not saying that like it's like the... It's not like the last day's dice W... Just the one thing that the one thing that kind of bug, bugs me about the current Dynamite show, the current Dynamite, Dynamite product, it feels like uh, AEW. Um, once we start to like somebody, once we once we start clamoring for more of a certain person, AEW kind of decides, okay, they're over. Let's move on, and we're done with that here. We're done with them for a while. Like Darby Allen gets over. He has a good match with Chris Jericho. Does some cool stuff, and then he's gone for a while because AWs decide, okay, he's over. We don't need to worry about that guy. Every week, they tend to feature people that uh, we don't really care about quite as much because AW really wants those people to be over, and they really want us to care about them. Like the, this pits of past week with the show closing with the Dark Order being up the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, which I already talked about in my column, but it's uh, an instance of where they really want us to like the Dark Order, and uh, they're going to keep forcing the Dark Order on us on television until we start caring about them. And I think the problem with this is, if they're just going to focus on the stuff every week on TV that we don't like with them, with, I mean, I I like Brandy Rhodes, okay? I'm, I'm a Brandy Rhodes fan. I enjoy what she brings to the table. But there are a lot of people who don't particularly care for the Nightmare Collective gimmick. But that's going to get featured every week because we want the damn thing to be over. 
And we're just going to keep it shoving it down your throats until you finally start liking it, maybe. I don't know. But I think Dynamite would be doing even better than it is right now if they would give us more of the stuff that people actually want to see instead of just trying to make us like stuff that we haven't really responded well to. My general response to the Brandy Rhodes stuff anymore is simply this, Steve, because I'm trying to be positive and I don't (laughs) want to get in trouble. So my response is this. Brandy Rhodes is a very pretty lady. She is. <laughs> that is where I will close that. Um, and I think she's a good talker. I think she is. I'm sorry. I think she's good. I talking, think the material shit, gimmicks. though. I mean, I, I think she has great yeah. delivery. Yeah, but the material yeah. is not good. And I, yeah. I agree with your, your point. That, like Darby Allen's a good example of what you're talking about. Darby Allen got over and then he disappeared for a while. And it's like, yeah, it's like you probably could have done a lot more with that. And, uh, I think they could be using MJF more, especially since he's feeding with Cody. And mm-hmm. and again, on, on the Dark Order thing, uh, and I t- tried to talk about this Wednesday night, I appreciate the hell out of what they're trying to do. I appreciate that they're trying to make stars. I appreciate that they're trying to take chances. But I also think you're doing it at the cost of too many other people that have some star power. And that you need to make sure you protect those well enough. And as Steve mentioned, he wrote a great column on that this week. So go over to 411 Mania and check that out. Steve, what was the title of that column? Ah, that's called, oh yes, AW Needs the Elite to be Elite. So make sure you check that out. You'll get a little more background on what we were just talking about. No, I totally agree with your point. And it's something... And I'm also trying to keep some perspective on this, Steve, because... This is a company that's only 12 weeks into TV. Yep. They're obviously going to make a lot of mistakes. And I do think the reports of AEW's death after that Dark Order segment are greatly <laughs> over exaggerated. A little bit. It's not the dying days of Dice W, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. I will say, though, that <laughs> thank God it isn't WCW because you realize if it was, we would have had Larry Zabisco out there calling them the Dark Order. <laughs> I don't know. That might have made it better, actually. I'm not sure. <laughs> I might take Larry Z over Jarrett at this point. I don't know. <laughs> well, I won't really argue too much, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with your points. I think, I think it's valid, man. You gotta... And again, I, I'm trying to... I'm not going to give them full carte blanche, but I'm trying to give them a little bit of rope because, I mean, it's it's 12 weeks in. There's going to be mistakes made, and I think that they do need to make some changes. I think booking committees are generally a bad idea and don't work. I think it's a in a um, a circumstance of too many cooks in the kitchen. And I think there are too many cooks in the kitchen that are afraid to... Uh, I think they're a little afraid to make other people unhappy, to be honest with you. Yeah. I also think that they need, uh, for lack of a better word, an editor. Uh, yeah. You know, you need to look at the show. You need to say, okay, we can kind of do without this. We can maybe shave a minute off of this or that, make the, you know stuff like that. Give this time to breathe, which was a a criticism I had about Wednesday's show. Again, I think the AEW shows have all been good to great, varying depending on the week. I even thought this week's show was a good show. It was not perfect. It had problems. Closing segment being one. One of the other things I said is the fact that I think you could have cut some stuff from that show or trimmed some stuff down because at some point you have to have. Time for the fans to digest things. And that's also a double-edged sword because Dynamite is a show that flies by. It feels like it has a great sense of urgency. It never feels slow like a Raw or SmackDown. You never sit there halfway through going, Christ, there's an hour left? (laughs) It's it's like I look at the clock sometimes and I'm like, holy shit, there's only 20 minutes left? That's true. And, I'm not usually looking to clock during Dynamite. That's a good point. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a double-edged sword because you want to keep that level of excitement up. But again, at some point, you've done something wrong from week one to week 12 in, in terms of viewership drop. So you need to figure out what was working, what, what, what you're doing wrong, how you can fix it. Not a perfect show. It can still be a good show without it being perfect, but they have things to fix. And hopefully, hopefully they go about the right ways to fix them. That's all. That's all we're saying out here, and we're allowed to make suggestions. I think. I think we're. I think we're allowed to be critical and uh, be constructive as well. I think. What's I'm not going out here saying that. I'm not out here saying that Kenny Omega and Young Bucks don't know a goddamn thing about the business. 
I'm just kind of saying, well, maybe you guys should feature yourselves a little better or something. I don't know. Yeah. All right. My next one, Steve Cook, is something we love, tag team wrestling, but it's something that I don't like. The New Japan Pro Wrestling Tag Team Divisions. Mmm. 30 years this business, Jado and Gato have been in wrestling. Fucking tag team wrestlers, great tag team. And these fuckers, despite all the good they've done for New Japan booking-wise, <laughs> cannot book any of the tag team divisions to save their life. Junior, heavyweight, or even the fucking Never Trios tag titles. <laughs> They're all booked horribly. And I have been on this for the last three years, and I was reminded of it this morning as I was reviewing Road to the Tokyo Dome. There was a great tag team match, Steve Cook, with Hiromu Takahashi and Evil facing Will Ospreay and Big Tom Ishii. Mm. It was a fucking great tag team match. I'm a big Ishii guy. Love me some Ishii. Well, it was great. They were all awesome. Hiromu is fucking fully back. Mm. Will was great. Evil was great. Ishii was great. Just a great match. And it was a purest example I could think of of why one singular open weight style tag team division is a more viable alternative than having two shit split tag team divisions. Why do they have two? Why? Why are there really enough tag teams? For no, a no, weight? there's not. That's the fucking problem. Okay. The divisions are booked horribly. <laughs> there's not enough teams. And the thing is, is like, like Will Ospreay a lot of the time ta- tags with Robbie Eagles as the Birds of Prey. Robbie Eagles is a junior. Osprey is about to fully go junior or heavyweight. I feel any day now, probably at the end of Wrestle Kingdom on the second night, I think he's fully going heavyweight. So the thing is, is even if Osprey's a heavyweight, him and Robbie Eagles can still be a tag team if it's just one tag team division. You can have Ishii t- tag with various guys instead of just Yoshihashi. He can tag with Rocky Romero. You can do all kind of shit. You have so many fucking people on the roster. You could actually build up some better tag teams. Like, I'll tell you what a hell of a tag team is. Naito and Bushi are a fucking great tag team. Yeah. They work tours a ton of the time, and when they have to tag, they they choose to tag together. Because Naito loves working with them. They're a great little tag team. (laughs) Obviously, Bushi's a junior, Naito's a heavyweight. So it's like if you have an open weight tag team division and for some reason you want to heat them up for a title shot, boom, there you go, because there's only one fucking tag team title. And then you're also cutting out another title that you don't need. One they have tag a lot of team titles. division, you fix a lot of problems, you can make bet tag teams, you can fix things, you can give a lot of guys direction. It's an easy call to make. They're not going to do it, but they should. I'm booking the territory, Steve. Let me tell you something real quick. <laughs> yeah. Final battle weekend, NWA um, into the fire pay-per-view weekend. I yeah. booked for these fucking companies. I gave them great ideas. Sure. End of final battle. I had the booking for 2020 set up. Villain Enterprises versus Roosh's new Lucha Stable. And sure. I, I had the big angle being shot to where Villain Enterprises tries to help PCO. But Roosh's new stable, including Flamita, Bandito, and his brother Dragon Lee, fight them off. Roosh retains the title, which he should have. And then that's his new trio. They feud with Villain Enterprises going into the next year. So what does ROH do? They give PCO the title, and then the next night they announce La Faction and Gobernable with Roosh, Ryu Lee, and, and Kenny fucking King. Yeah, yeah. What? I, I, I was wondering about that myself. Kenny yeah. fucking King, Steve. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I, I No, so anyway, let's fast forward into the fire. Two out of three falls main event. James Storm, Nick Aldis, special referees favoring either man. Coin toss to give you a third one if it has to go to a third. <clears throat> I booked this main event for them too. <laughs> Title change to James Storm. You go to the third fall. The NWA picks Camille as the referee. The fix is in. The wild cards join in. They screw Nick Aldis. Mm. You have a power faction. Yeah. All right. I get partial credit on this one. After the pay-per-view, they they form a power faction. Nick Aldis keeps the title. Camille attacks James Storm. And Nick Aldis is the leader of the... The Dollar Tree Horseman, I guess we're going to call him right now. Because sure, fucking why wild not? cars are shit. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly. It's I mean, fucking Bram. That's one of those groups. Anyway, that's you know, just like AEW, one of those groups you won't give up on. 
It's Bram, for fuck's sake, Steve. I mean, does Billy have to pay off the 19 TNA contracts he has? Possibly. Might might be. Is might that be, why which... he's in the NWA? Does Billy still owe him for all those contracts? I got to tell you, I was a little depressed when I was thinking about the NWA like a day or two ago. I was like thinking, well, you know, they really need to get on TV. They got to have a TV deal. And I'm thinking, well, goddamn, doesn't they access TV have like every fucking wrestling promotion under the sun now? And then I thought about for a second, and then second later, I remembered, oh, shit. Yeah, Billy does, probably doesn't like him too much. Yeah, that's well, it's right. Not that Billy doesn't like him. Do you think Impact is going to fucking bring him on? No. <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> Not quite. So that's kind of the problem there. Yeah, but I, I've been booking the territory, Steve, and this, people got to listen to me. But anyway, I gave them ideas, and they they, they gave me partial credit because they kind of did it. They're like, "Hey, this is a great fucking idea. We're gonna change it though." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. The, so it's uh, all this and the wild cards. Do they have somebody else there. I'm trying to. Remember. No, it's just all this and the wild cards. Somebody's gonna be added, but I won't spoil it. Okay. And uh, Camille was with him, which I, I might mean, have read that and forgot. <laughs> I mean, Camille, bonus points for Camille, obviously. But... Well, sure. Why not? I mean, that's so. a good talent right there. All right. So your next one. Do you have a next one, Steve? All right. Um, uh, this one's not quite as – it doesn't have me quite as worked up as some of these other ones. But uh, I told – I was telling you about that over on, on Wednesday night on, uh, after the Dynamite. I guess is after the Dark Show. Uh, we decided then the show – and with everybody giving Stone Cold Stunners to uh, the, t- the 10 guy, right? Sean Spears. Uh, apparently, this is some kind of cockamamie thing because it's Stone Cold Steve Austin's birthday. We're going to honor him by giving people a stunner. I don't know. It was something they were doing. And uh, when you know and when you know it, uh, the last guy to come out there and give Sean Spears the old stunner, your friend and mine, Jacksonville Dixie. Uh, I don't yeah. I don't even I don't I don't dislike Tony Khan that much. I just like the name. I think it's funny, you know. Okay. Good stuff, ja- Jacksonville Dixie. I, I don't know, but uh, but the thing is, it always starts out like this. It starts out like this for everybody, for every person with money that enters the wrestling business that wants to be a promoter. At first, they're not on television yet. They're just kind of hanging out behind the scenes. But then, you know, everybody tries to start winning them over. Everybody's kissing their butts. Everybody's telling them how great they are. And when they're telling them how great they are, all of a sudden it's like, you know what you need to do? You need to go on TV. You need to be on the show every week. You need to be the top star because you're just a fantastic person. Yes, you are. And I'm not just saying that so I can keep my job and get pushed. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You're a great person. You would be a great performer on television. And I just, I'm left wondering how long it's going to be before Tony Khan kind of starts taking this advice. And we see Tony Khan on TV every week as the evil promoter because, you know, every wrestling promotion has to have a goddamn evil promoter. That's just how things work. It is what it is. And, uh, man, I just, I just hope it doesn't happen. So I'm out here in front of it right now to tell Tony Khan, Mr. Jacksonville Dixie, sir, no. No, you're not paying me to kiss your ass. So I can sit here and I can tell you right now, you're you're best behind the scenes, man. I mean, you seem like a nice guy. I'm not hating on you. But, man, I just do not need you out, out there on television. I don't need you out in front of the crowd getting people stunners. You're not a trained wrestler. Just stop. It's not good. It's a bad look. I I don't really care about the after show thing, but I am with you. I do not want this man on TV. I don't need... Fucking people that shouldn't be on TV on TV don't need to see it, don't want it, don't need it. No, no and time. You know for it. people are. T- you know people are telling him that too. You know they're kissing his ass and telling him he needs to be needs to be on TV star. I mean, I heard about how Aubrey Hebner is jumping up and down when he's giving the guy a stunner. She's, you know, kissing his ass. No, stop. No, don't don't encourage this man. Yeah, we definitely don't need that. Um, my next grievance is that. There are not nearly enough tightly laid out two and a half hour wrestling shows for my liking. Mm. Um, the last takeover, Steve Cook, just under two and a half hours. NW, which was a great fucking show. NWA into the fire, just under two and a half hours. Good paper. You yep. enjoyed it. I've said this. I mean, for a four plus hour show to be looked at as a quality show. That show needs to be really, really fucking great. 
needs to have multiple five star matches. Is what you, is what you're saying? You need to have good shit. I mean, Jeremy and I talked about it, and I know it hurts some people because of the time difference. But like, the reason Wrestle Kingdom a lot of the time doesn't get knocked for the long run time is because there are normally like three, four match of the year contenders on January fourth. Yep. You know, and then by the end of the year, a lot of them are still sticking around. So that's why that doesn't get, but I mean, it's a rarity. You have to fucking deliver really, really great shit, which is why after 13 hours of WrestleMania, you know, people were like, I mean, it was kind of good at times, but it was just okay at the end. If that. Yeah. Because the, the good is so spread out and the shows are usually horribly paced. And, yeah, I mean, you just, which is, again, why I am all for the two-night WrestleMania thing. Drop TakeOver, do a two-night WrestleMania. Much better off, I think. And I mean, I, you know you know why I stopped doing the pay-per-view recaps, right? Uh, because you have a life and a shoot job in the morning? Because I have a life and a shoot job in the morning. I can't stay up until fucking 12 o'clock at night to recap goddamn WrestleMania. When it started at 5 o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do that. It's just not w- within my means. I know Larry can do it because this is his job. I know Lambert can do it because I don't know if he has a job or not. I know there are plenty of people out there that can. I can't, and it just got, it got to the point where I was like, no, it's that's not for me anymore. I'm not. I'm just gonna move on. And it's honestly to the point now where I just don't end up watching a lot of WWE pay per views because uh, you know you see that runtime. It's just like. Mm, no, I just don't have that. And by the way, th- this is not just a shot at WWE because AEW is one, pay- one of the pay per views. They do it, they do it one- too, yeah. Well, no, they don't do it all the time, but the one pay per view was over five hours. And I was like, that's too long, dude. Don't do that. I remember one of, those, one of the, the Fighter Fest or Fight for Fall, and those had some pretty long times too, didn't they? Uh, I don't remember offhand. I know, I think it was. Uh, I think they ran pretty long. I think it was Double or Nothing that went like five hours, though. And that was like. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So again, this is not just a WWE thing, but obviously they are one of the biggest um, offenders. Culprits, yeah, offenders. Thank yeah. you. I was word salad, man. Just fucking yeah. losing shit. But uh, yeah, so it's you need to yeah to more more tighter two and a half hour wrestling shows, man. Not everything has to be a marathon. Give me give me the goods. See, that's what I, that's another reason I got out of cover and evolve. Part of it was because they run on Friday and Saturday. And SmackDown's on Friday now, and there's a ton of other shows yeah. on Saturdays. The other thing is, is they went away from the five to six match format that was done in two and a half hours, and now they're using a bunch of NXT people and stuff, and now they're doing fucking like eleven match, three and a half hour shows. And I just, I don't got video on demand time for that, dude. No, no. I and just, man, and I, and I'm a little depressed too that the rest of the shows haven't been on the network since they they did that one show on the network and. I enjoyed watching that, but no, they haven't been back since. Uh, maybe happen and see the rumored tiered network. Ah, yeah, but then we we'll want more money, right? <coughs> Probably. More money. Yeah, that'll be the problem there. Your next one. I have, uh, I have, uh, I have one more grievance. Okay. One more grievance. I might still think it's more. You never know. But the the last one I have on the list here, and this is kind of a problem that. Uh, is probably not going to go away, of course, because I know being part of a wrestling website, we got to get the clicks. It's important. I mean, it generates money, it generates funds, all these things. But you know that one of the banes of my existence as far as uh, wrestling reporting and stuff goes is uh, the existence of people like Corey Graves and people like Bully Ray and people like Disco Inferno and other people that have podcasts. And we have to hear about everything they have to say about every goddamn thing. And I just, I don't care about what Corey Graves has to say about most things. I'm sorry. I just don't. Am I alone on this? I know, I know no, I'm not alone. No, no. I mean, a lot I of people don't care about what Corey Graves has to say. I can't a lot of people imagine... don't care about what Bully Ray has to say or Disco Inferno. But every goddamn week, we just got to, you know, it, you can go listen to your podcast, I know. and then, But then we have to have... You know, Bully Ray says this, and then five hours later, Bully Ray says this. And then, you know, four hours, Bully Ray says this. Enough of Bully Ray. I just don't care. 
I can't imagine wanting to invest hours into a Corey Graves podcast after suffering through two hours of him on Friday. Good Lord. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine. I yeah. I know Lambert's a big listener. God bless. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, and that's, that's like you said, it's it's one of those things. It's a revenue driver. I understand where you're coming from. I agree with it. I'm just glad I don't have to cover it anymore. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys are covering Disco Inferno's uh, venture or stuff. I don't know if you guys do that or not. I don't give a fuck about Disco yeah. Inferno, man. Well, people still post this shit for some reason. Not me. I have one more as well, Steve, and you kind of All brought right. him up already. Bully fucking Ray. <laughs> this fucking piece of shit. <laughs> I have gone into detail time and time again. I get one of the major problems with the downfall of ROH with him getting some creative control. So not uh, only do you have the lizard man who's already like eight years past his expiration. He's date, already, yeah, he's terrible. Yeah. You, you got bully Ray in there. Do <laughs> you know who I am? Yeah. I'm a fucking hall of famer. <laughs> I was an ECW chant for tables, please. While I wank off to myself, <laughs> I'm going to get my girlfriend a job here and her friend. Does and she even do like, anything there anymore? No, like, Vel and Sky, like, fucking disappeared. It was funny. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, here's the thing. This fucking dude, he doesn't work anymore. He disappears, and then he comes back and does random feuds. Like, he did that horrible feud with Flip Gordon. And then everybody <laughs> goes, well, it was okay. He put Flip over at the end. No. No, he didn't. You know why he didn't? Because it took like eight people to fucking help Flip overcome the odds at the end and a bunch of weapons for him to beat Bully Ray. So he really didn't get put over at the end. Did he enter Flip Gordon or did Flip get hurt some other way? Flip got hurt another way. That, well, oh, okay. that wasn't Bully. No, I was going to blame him for that too. So, <laughs> and then this year, this year it was Mark Haskins. Bully Ray was gone for like six months and it was fucking glorious. <laughs> and then this asshole shows up. And starts attacking Mark Haskins and harassing his wife. And then they have the big blow-off match at Final Battle, which was a bad fucking match. It was a garbage Bully Ray match because he can't do anything else because he put on all the weight he lost when he was in Impact. <laughs> yeah, because he, he came in... Remember when he, they came to TNA and he was still all overweight? And then yeah. he got into really great shape. He really did. He got he had that one good run there. We'll give him credit for that. Yeah, and now he's back to looking like mid-2000s Bully Ray. And he can't do anything. He just goes out there and lumbers around and yells, do you know who I am? And... <laughs> Beats the shit out of Mark Haskins for 95% of this match until Mark Haskins, with the help of his wife, (laughs) finally gets to beat Bully Ray. Oh, there you go. And he did not put him over in any way, shape, or fucking form, so don't tell me he did. And then it got worse. (laughs) Two days after Final Battle, they're doing the Final Battle Fallout show. The Women of Honor division is a total fucking shit show. It they're, really is. They're, they're trying to make Maria Manic a star. She killed they Angelina Love. They don't have a champion Love. now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She kills Angelina Love at the pay-per-view. And then she comes out, and Angelina Love calls her out. She goes out and beats the shit out of her and Mandy Leanne again. She gets a table, and Bully Ray comes out. Ugh, and why? he choke slams her through a table. <laughs> and allegedly the story is... Bully Ray's character did this because Maria Manic was going to desecrate his legacy by putting somebody through a table in the ECW arena. And the story and the goal is, in Bully Ray's mind, is he's going to beat the shit out of Maria Manic and allegedly put her over at the end and make her a star. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Get the fuck <laughs> out of here with this. <laughs> That is legitimately one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. That is just awful. Be gone with you, Bully Ray. <sighs> Thank God they didn't give him a TNT deal. As long as I say about that, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I've had enough. I I feel I feel much better that we've aired these grievances, Steve. I do feel a bit cleansed. Yes, we have aired our grievances, got all out in the open, and uh, we can hold off now for another 365 days or so. That's right. Um, I do, Stephen. I appreciate you jumping on here. It's a uh, good to relive the tradition of the old blog talk days and yeah, get get the grievances out and talk. Um, 
So that's going to wrap us up. Uh, this has been the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, the 411mania.com website, and any major podcasting platform. Please make sure to subscribe to our show, share us around, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on the podcasting platform of your choice, and especially iTunes. Thank you, and I hope you have a great Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, New Year's, whatever the hell you guys celebrate. Have a good one.